And hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Kuehl Show. I am your host today, the insider of the insiders, Tyler Kuehl. And ladies and gentlemen, it is a Monday, another Monday, which means another hashtag TKS here on 12 Ounce Sports. Of course, if you're watching us live on 12 Ounce Sports, that means you're watching us on the YouTube, on the Twitter, on the Facebook, and on Channel Zingo TV, Channel 761. I got the channel in there a little early. Channel 761 on Zingo TV. If you want to check it out where there's more than just 12 ounce sports, go on Zingo TV and check it out by using the promo code 12 ounce. That's one, two, the letter O and Z or Z for you improper English users. And we are what? So I got on right now. Danny Jansen's hurt. I got the Jays on right now on the TV in here, MLB.TV. Bottom of the sixth, Jays up five to one. Danny Jansen just got dinged with a foul tip and it looks like he's okay. Gosh, bless it. We already had a near miss earlier when Vladdy Jr. got nailed with a pitch in on the hands, and that got me a little bit worried because right now they're beating the Rangers, which is always a good thing. We'll get to this game in a second. Kelly's leaving right now. She said goodbye. Bye, Kelly. Everyone say goodbye to Kelly if you're tuning in, of course, on the live chat on YouTube. And we'll get to the baseball here in a second because I got a lot of things to say because it does pertain to the first part of today's show. Now, why does it pertain to the day show? Because if you're not watching us right now, which means you're listening us to the re- listening to the replay of us here on the QL show on your favorite podcatcher, whether it be Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Radio.com, Last FM, TuneIn Radio. Did I miss one yet? I think I got most of them. Anyways, regardless, that's where you're listening on your favorite podcast. Also, if you're watching the replay on the QL show YouTube channel. So that means if you had to tune out in about an hour, that's okay. Puck drops at seven o'clock. I don't want to turn you away from your guys' games. We're going to have Montreal and Edmonton tonight on the screen after this ball game's over with. So I get it. But make sure, though, you check out the YouTube channel is Stephen Matz is dealing with a six strikeout. Just putting him down right now up there at Globe Life Field. Not gone wood. We'll get to this game, like I said, in a second. But we got to make sure we thank our amazing sponsors here today. Can never forget about the people that make sure this show is possible Make sure the show actually happens, which includes our good friends at mybookie.ag down there in the corner, mybookie.ag. Guys, we got the national championship tonight live. I don't know what chance it's on CBS. I don't know what time it's at, but because it's college basketball and I haven't watched a lot. I did watch that uh, the semifinals on Saturday with my good buddy Cooper Weidenthaler. But did you guys watch that Arizona Stanford game last night, though? Stanford, women's national champions in the college basketball realm. Good congratulations to them. Knocking off the Wildcats. Great game as well. Another close game. Been a lot of close games here down the stretch here in the NCAA tournament, both the men's and women's. And make sure, though, if you want to bet on the game tonight, you can. MyBookie.ag. If you also want to bet on NBA games, Major League Baseball, and NHL, and more, go on MyBookie.ag. Use the promo code 12 on Sports 10 for free. Win and get paid on MyBookie.ag. And, of course, as always, second string leather company up there in the corner. Get it. Seventh strikeout for Steven Matz. Second Ching Leather Company, hashtag crafted from the crease. Collection number eight's out right now, guys. Check it out. Razor Ray Emery gear from the mid-2000s Ottawa Senators. Rest in peace, Razor. Those That gear is out with this new collection. It's awesome. It's great. Keep your eyes on it. Go to secondstringleather.com. Order your wallets, your keychains, your bathroom bags, all that good stuff on Second Ching Leather Company, secondstringleather.com. Hashtag crafted. From the crease. And of course, as always, make sure you t- check out our awesome Teespring website for the Kuehl Show. Teespring.com slash store slash the Kuehl Show with dashes between the and Kuehl and show. Get your awesome merchandise. Get your t-shirts. Get your sweaters. We're going to get some cutoffs here coming up soon because it's going to get hot outside in the summertime. So make sure you get your awesome stuff from Teespring.com slash stores slash the Kuehl Show. Get your awesome swag. You see me wear the shirts all the time. Kelly's worn the sweater before. I can't wear the sweater on the show because it's hot as balls in this studio. I have the window open right now because it's about 65 degrees right now here in West Michigan after we had hail this morning. So it's obviously getting a little bit warmer out. Now, the people say it's supposed to rain later at the end of this week. Hopefully not. I have a few softball games I like to do, and I like to broadcast softball because, well, it's the closest thing I got to baseball, and, you know, I like to I like baseball. I actually like softball, too. It's a very fun sport. It's a lot. It's like, how do I describe it to people? It's fast-paced baseball. That's how I describe it. It's fun to fun to watch, fun to call. Cooper and I, we called the game together with masks on, by the way. And we had a good time. Had a good time with it this past weekend. We'll be doing that all season for Davenport University. 
So what we're going to talk about today, well, obviously, like we talked about collegiate athletics, we're going to be talking about the Frozen Four, of course. We would be remiss if we did not. And of course, we'll be talking about with that, the Hobie Baker Award. We'll be talking about the nominees, the hat trick nominees. I'm going to give my take on who's going to win. Uh, if you know who I am, by the way, seventh strikeout, <laughs> all three strikeouts, puts him up, puts him down. One, two, three does Steven Matz. Jay's retired this side. Head to the seventh up by four. We'll be talking about the Frozen Four. And if you know that I was a goaltender back in the day, you'll know who my pick is going to be for the Hobie Baker. But stay tuned on why I explain later on. I give my pick for the Frozen Four as well. We were going to get Pat Micheletti on. Unfortunately, the Minnesota Wild are a little bit more important. And I kind of get that. Hey, Pat, you want to do an NHL game or you want to do a kid's podcast? Uh, hockey, NHL game. Sure. That makes sense. That makes more sense, right? I, I don't blame him one bit. We'll definitely get him on, try to get him on next week. We do have one guest confirmed for next week. Can't say anything yet. Shush, shush, hush, hush. We'll get it to you guys next week because that's why you got to make sure you follow us at The Kula Show, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Make sure you follow us on all of your favorite social media sites to make sure you know exactly what's going on in the world of TKS. And we also have some funny things as well. So that said, well, like I said, we'll talk about the Frozen Four, Hobie Baker Awards. We'll get into some of the moves Uh, a couple of possible trade talk because the trade deadline is in one week, which means literally we're going to come on this show next Monday night with literal wall-to-wall trade deadline coverage. Six o'clock, just like per normal. It'll be a few hours after the deadline. Will we have much to talk about? I don't know yet. Everyone's hoping for a trade deadline. Nick Alberga, the Golden Muzzy on Twitter, was kind enough to say there's got to be a trade today. And I said, anytime between six o'clock and 8.30, 8.30 Eastern time tonight, that would be awesome. So far... I have not heard anything yet, so we are still clear on the, yes, no, as of right now, we are, we have no trades yet. I had to make sure I got Twitter open right here, making sure we know everything that's going on. Um, News coming out of Boston tonight, the Boston Bruins, they have a, pardon me, I was, they had, they had two different goaltenders tonight dan vladar 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 or vladar and jeremy swayman were on the ice for morning skate today they have not made oh, i haven't heard i have not heard official word yet on who is starting but this would be the first start for i believe either vladar or the yeah vladar or jeremy swayman jeremy swayman last year's mike richter award winner he was able to somehow magically beat out the good guy in Jeremy Swayman, or Jeremy Swayman beat Dryden McKay out for the job last year. Uh, let's see. Jeremy Swayman will be wearing number one. I'm looking to see if there's any news. By the way, that game yesterday, Boston and Pittsburgh, what a, or Saturday, excuse me, what a crazy game that was. Saw a great effort, though, from uh, on the flop by our good buddy, Sidney Crosby. We'll get to that in a little bit. I'm not seeing anything yet right now. Let me see if I type in Jeremy Swayman and see what we get here. Tyler, why don't you look this up before the show? Well, because, kids, I just didn't really think to look about it. There's a lot of other things. Um, let's see. Still, yep, that's the last update we have is... Vladar gets the goal tonight. Wait, what? With Vladar getting... Hold on. Um, I'm reading this one tweet here. Should be interesting to see how... Blah, 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 blah. And the... Oh, they're saying, will he get a start soon? Because it sounds like Vladar is going to start tonight. Dan Vladar. I hope I'm saying that right. Is it Vladar or Vladar? I don't know. Uh, so we'll keep tabs on that in the Boston game tonight. That is the 7, seven o'clock puck drop for the Bruins. Bruins taking on Philadelphia tonight. So you really could go with either or. Boston gets Philly tomorrow night as well. So you could see back-to-back where you're going to have to see Jeremy Swayman play one of the two. I'm excited for Swayman because Swayman played on a mediocre main Black Bears team last year and still had one of the best save percentages in the country as well as, I believe he was, was he second for saves or first for saves last year? He was something ridiculous. He was put through the ringer last year, and I think if he if he gives given an honest shot, he should be the guy that, you know, he could be a starter here for some time in the National Hockey League if he's able to transfer that ability from college to the NHL. Now, we've seen it before where goaltenders can't pull that off. That is the, that's, you know, I'm, I'm going back to guys like Jeff Lurg, who was an outstanding college goaltender. However, size and injuries hindered him. 
uh, Adam Burkle, national championship winning goaltender with Denver, beating Maine. I'm not mistaken. Yeah, beating Maine one nothing. Was it Maine? It was UNH? I think it was Maine. Win one nothing in 2004, and had to stop a five on three to end the game to win the national championship. Didn't quite pan out. I remember seeing him in Grand Rapids for a year or two. Oh uh, gosh, that was over 10 years ago now. That's how long ago it was. But that's what I'm saying. So, but he, you got to give him reps. You got to give him chances. I think he can be a good goaltending prospect. If anything, he turns into a guy like Al Montoya. Can be a starter, but is a good 1B goaltender as well. That would be an interesting look at for Jeremy Swayman. A couple of things we're going to get to today. We're going to get to a couple, a couple stars got fined. A couple superstars got fined. Also, one player got suspended. Now, I got my takes on those as well. And we're also let's we're also going to get to COVID, obviously. And that's why I'm wearing my Canuck shirt today, and which is why the Jays and Rangers game that's going on right now is so important. Now, let's start off, though, by first of all, wishing Joe Bowen a happy birthday. 70 years old for Bonesy. Joe Bowen at Bonesy tweets on Twitter. If you follow him, give him a shout out. Say happy birthday, man. One of the best broadcasters in the game. Foster Hewitt Memorial Award winner. One of my favorites growing up. Still is, you know, him, Ken Cal, Ken Daniels, Bob Cole, um, Dave Strader. That he's up there with those guys. I love listening to Bonesy. You know, I, I have to go to bed. So like last night, for example, I have to go to bed because I work early in the morning, right? So it's a nine o'clock puck drop between Calgary in and Toronto over at the Saddle Dome. And so I'm like, what do I do? I go to bed. But I turn on my phone, turn it on to the NHL app, open up the stream for the radio broadcast, and listen to Joe Bowen. And let me tell you, as it's going to sound bad, but it's it's great to go to sleep to because A, you can listen to the game, and B, just kind of soothing and relaxing. He's got that kind of voice where, you know, he's able to call games, make it interesting, but also at the same time not seem overbearing. Then again, he's been doing this. For, he's called over 3,000 games. 3,000 NHL games, by the way. That's impressive. There's not many guys that are still around from the 80s and have been doing it consistently for one team, <laughs> both radio and television as well. Bowensy has been up and down the lineup, and he has been doing it for so long. Happy birthday to Joe Bowen. Also, big news out of the women's game, Patty Kazmaier Award, awarded to Northeastern netminder Aaron Frankel. Aaron Frankel, who... I didn't look up the numbers, unfortunately, in terms of greatest seasons of all time. But here are her numbers this year, guys. Ready for this? 22-1. and one. That is 20 wins, two losses, and a tie. 20 wins, most in the country. A 965 save percentage, first in the country. Nine shutouts, first in the country. And here is the biggest number of all. Now, yes, I always pride the save percentage is probably the biggest stat for a goaltender. That's why 965 is impressive. But here's the one that gets me. 0.81. That is a decimal, the number eight, and the number one. A sub one goals against average. Obviously, first in the country. Ridiculous numbers. Unfortunately, yes, they fell short in the national title game to Wisconsin, but... Those are incredible numbers. She also played the most minutes, playing over 1,400 minutes this season, played in every game for Northeastern, sixth in the country in saves with 526. And guess what? She's at the camp right now for the U.S. national team because she's going to be on the team come the World Championships in Halifax next month. She is having one of the best seasons in the history of women's college hockey. And let me tell you guys, the United States are we're already in this tournament going to be a dangerous team. Now, I don't know if Frankel's going to be the starting goaltender, but not just for this year, but for years to come, this U.S. team is going to continue to be impressive and be a favorite at the Worlds, at next year's Olympics. They are going to be legit. They are going to be the favorites because of the goaltending that Frankel will bring going forward. Now, I don't know what she's going to plan to do next season if she may just stick with the national program and just continue to work and get ready for the Olympics because that may happen because either you try to play in the NWHL for a little bit and we'll get to the National Women's Hockey League in just a moment. We obviously with a lot of stuff that happened yesterday, we'll get to it. But in terms of Frankel, does she go to the NWHL? Does she try to do the pro women's 
Pro Women's Hockey Players Association, the Dream Gap Tour. I mean, there's obviously a lot of talent for the Americans there as well. Abby Rock, we're looking at you, Hillary Knight. So I like to think, I don't know. I mean, for her, it's going to be reps, right? It's going to be wanting to play a lot. How many games are you going to want to play? Especially as a goaltender, you want to be fresh going to the Olympics. And then that's, of course, saying if she ends up being tabbed or looked at as a possible favorite to be the starting goaltender in Beijing of next year. That's all to be foreseen, obviously. But as of right now, best goaltender in college hockey, best player in college hockey, Patty Kazemeyer Award, awarded to Aaron Franklin of Northeastern. Congratulations to Miss Frankel. And so let's get this out of the way. We'll get to the COVID thing in just a second, the Jays and Rangers in just a second. We need to address what happened yesterday or what came out yesterday regarding the Toronto Six president and head coach, Digit Murphy. So I, I'm going to pull up the tweet. I forgot to pull. That's another thing I forgot to pull up before the show today. And it, this sucks. So, all right. So Digit Murphy yesterday, it came out. First tweet I saw was from Melissa Burgess. Melissa Burgess, make sure I get her credentials right. She works at the Victory Press, um, Die by the Blade. Also works with the Buffalo Junior Sabres and Kanisha Taki. So there was a, um, I don't know where this exactly came from. It was, I don't know where this conversation came from, where this interview came from, but what Digi Murphy said, obviously in an interview, she said, quote, just one or two trans girls, transgender, for those that don't understand the shortening of words, trans girls who are decent athletes will displace a lot of females. And that's why I tweeted last night, damn it, Digit. Because Digit Murphy, remember we had her on the show, probably I think it was about a week before they announced the Lake Placid bubble. Well, a week or two before. And that conversation was so much fun. Because here's Digit Murphy, first-year head coach, president of the brand-new Toronto Six, a fun hockey team that everyone's going to love to follow. They're exciting. Their Twitter's fun. They're awesome. And then she comes out with this bonehead statement, and I just thought to myself, no, because it's one of those things where it's there's a lot of people that are angry about this. Nathan Strauss from UMass, he he came out and gave his piece, and deservedly so. I'm dis- and, But my thing is, I, I don't know if I'm angry or if I'm just disappointed. Because here you are, here's Digit Murphy, arguably has the platform to be one of the most influential members of the game. She is part of the women's sports policy working group who is in charge of, or not in charge of, but as a group that is helping try to grow women's athletics. And she has this platform to be such a positive influence on the game. And then she throws this. Because this is, that's why I say it, because here's the thing. Transgender women, are women. That's what they are. That's why they are transgender. And that's why it sucks because that you're saying that just because they were not born that way, that makes them not female. And they're going to take, and that's, that's my problem with the whole scenario is the fact that she came out and said that, Oh my gosh, they're going to take their job. It's like saying it's, how am I going to put this without sounding like a complete turducken? It's the equivalent of me saying, Oh no, they're all these girls are going to come take the guys jobs. That's not how that's not it's painful because I, I hate the fact that this is what she said. She should not have said I, is it one of those things because we've learned with Digi Murphy. She's off the cuff. She's she wings it. She's she's genuine. She's not scripted. And then this came out and this is like and that kids is why you, oh man. And that, and the worst part is, is like, I, 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 I want to talk and this way. You want to talk to digit about. So these sort of things, cause you want to know what was going through her head when she said that was, is that what she actually means? Is that because that hurts and it's, it almost brings everything that the six have done, inclusion, diversity, all of that, that she promoted on our program on every media outlet she could talk to the Steve Dangle podcast every radio hit she did in Toronto every radio hit she did around the world everything she said now goes backwards it, it's taken now with the grain of salt which is not what you want right now in women's sports not just women's hockey women's sports that's what disappoints me so much is because of the fact that 
she said it, and you just know. And, you know, there may be an apology. And the Toronto Six come out and said, we're going to have conversations now about this, about really going full forward with inclusion. And the Toronto Six have tried to do damage control today. And unfortunately, I, I here, the problem is now, as long as she's in charge, that will hang over that will hang over like a cloud over the Toronto Six. As long as she is there helping run the organization, coaching the team, that's how it's going to be. And that's what sucks the most. There have been a couple people that are transgender that actually reached out to the Toronto Six when they were still looking for players that have come out and said that they did not get an honest look. And obviously now they have a good idea why. And, and it hurts. It hurts because you really thought she's going to be a positive influence on this game. She's going to be outstanding. She's what this game needs right now. And then this happens. It sucks to a T to see a possible game changer for women's hockey. Someone that can re- that has the energy, has the excitement, and the drive to push women's hockey and push women's sports to heights that I have never been seen before. Heights that we want to see in the women's game. And then comes back with this. I don't know. I'm not going to start screaming, oh my, you know, they need to get rid of her. They may have to. That may be the end game here for all of this. I, I don't know what else they can do right now with the exception of that. My thing, like, shockingly enough, Digit Murphy's been off social media today. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. She likes to post those 37, 37 seconds for Title IX videos. That has not happened yet in this Monday, March the, March the, April the 5th. It's April now. Baseball's on for gosh sakes. It's got to be April. So we'll, we'll wait to see what all happens moving forward. We'll keep you updated on the news. Obviously, this is a fluid story, developing story. But as of right now, it's not looking good in Toronto in terms of the National Women's Hockey League. Now, moving on here. Oh, we're at, all right, 20 some odd minutes in the show. Nice. I didn't think that, I'll be honest, I didn't think I was going to go that long with that. So, right now we got the Jays and the Rangers on. It is six and a third innings for Stephen Matz. Only one run given up, nine strikeouts. He was fantastic today. One walk, one earned run on two hits, 91 pitches. Great start in his first start as a Toronto Blue Jay. Five or five one lead. They score another one. By the way, uh, Alejandro Kirk is now the catcher for the Jays. Danny Jansen out. That's not good for the Blue Jays' sake because you can't really, I mean, Danny Jansen, while his bat has kind of come in and not really helped out at all, he he's one of the best defensive catchers in the game. He's got a great arm, very underrated in my eyes. Now, yes, am I a Jays fan? That's kind of how it works. And maybe pulling for the home team a little bit. Now, we just had a series with Gary Sanchez with the Yankees where he had two homers and whatnot. But anyways, so this game is going on at Globe Life Field, the new Globe Life Field, or the second year for Globe Life Field in Texas. Home of the Rangers. They had last year's World Series there, if you remember, folks. And it is a packed ballpark. Full house. 6-1, by the way, Jays, in the bottom of the seventh. It is a packed ballpark there a Globe Life Field. This is not a baseball podcast, for those that, are, those that know that. And yes, Dad, big win for the Wings. We'll get to that here in just a moment. But it is a packed ballpark in Texas. And I'm watching this game right now, and they got this little fancy club section behind home plate, and they're showing the folks in the stands and whatever. There's not a mask in sight. And, oh, but Tyler, that's the rule. That's the, the, they took away the mask mandate there in Texas. What does that have to do with the tea in China? You're out here during a massive pandemic, which, by the way, numbers in Texas are still a little over three to 4,000 per day of cases. Out here just running around with, you know, without masks on, sitting next to each other. Oh, there's a mask with a woman that has it hanging off her ear like it's a gosh darn earring. That's a good, that's a useful way to wear a, my, uh, a mask, folks, an N95 mask. Like, how in the world is this actually acceptable? I, I don't get it. I My thing is this. There's a pandemic going on. You think you want to be a little bit more safer as the Jays are able to get a double play right here. Nice throw by Bochet. Get out of the inning. Because the, Re- the Rangers now have no reason why they should ever win a ball game because they have these kind of rules in that state. 
But everybody, and I've said this myself, it's Texas. I shouldn't expect anything less. However, that's not the point. The point of the matter is that COVID's real. Point right here. The Vancouver Canucks. They have, over the past couple weeks, had to cancel a few games because over 20 members of the organization have tested positive for COVID-19. Both players and family members. As of right now, 16 players have tested positive for COVID-19. That's over half the roster, if you know your math. And I know just enough to know that's over half of their roster has COVID-19. Now, here's the thing about this, folks. This is not just, by the way, everyone's probably like, oh, see, finally Canada gets their wave through the division because the North Division for so long was doing such a great job of avoiding having problems with COVID-19. Now, yes, the BC area, British Columbia province is having a lot of issues with the new variants coming into the country. And it's really hitting right now in the Western Plains of Canada. And now there's also positive cases coming through Alberta as well. So I obviously have to keep an eye on the Oilers coming up here in Calgary. But my point is this. You don't want to take it seriously, yet people are vomiting, are severely dehydrated. Now, Elliot Friedman went on Hockey Central today and said a few of the players that had the really bad symptoms, that had the really bad after effects from COVID-19, are starting to recover and get a little bit better. However, they are still tested positive again and again and again and again. And now there's games that are being canceled up the wazoo and they may not play now for two weeks. And there's people saying that they should just bag it for the season. Except for you folks at CTV News that showed a tweet that said Thatcher Demko was saying they should just cancel the season, even though that was not actually Thatcher Demko's account. Way to go there, CTV interns. You're doing a great job up there. Good job. But my point is this. You're not going to take it seriously. I'm glad the league now, a lot of the players are like, whoa, this is a problem here. However, there's a couple people out in the media that are the Steve Simmons type that are saying, what's now going to happen when the Canucks come back rested and these teams that are battling for a playoff spot are have to play them? Well, first of all, know the room, read the room here, and realize that this is a little bit more important than teams going off for a playoff race when people's families are getting affected by this, this, this virus. COVID-19 is not going to just go away tomorrow, guys. Yes, everyone is getting vaccinated. I'm half vaccinated right now. I know a lot of other people in the area that are fully vaccinated. My wife is fully vaccinated. That does not mean this coronavirus is just going to wither away into nothing. Emphasis on this ball game here in Texas. Everyone's just walking around all excited. Oh, I'm glad I don't have to wear a mask. I get to hang out with all my friends at the ballpark. Have fun when you test positive and can't go to work for two weeks, you gosh darn jack wagons. Can't wait for all these. Oh, look, there are two people wearing masks. Good for those guys. Hey, look at that. Two out of, what, 40,000 there at Globe Life Field? They're doing great. But that's my point right now. That's why I come out. I'm, we're thinking about all the folks up there that are in Vancouver, the Canucks organization, everyone everyone out there that has, has been having problems with COVID. It's a real virus. It's a terrible virus. I tested positive. My wife tested positive. And we're just glad that our symptoms were the bare minimum. I had a fever for like six hours. The wife lost her taste and smell for like two days. That's all we ever, that's all the problems we had. However, there are people out there that are experiencing severe symptoms. Like I said, folks within the Canucks organization. And that's just within a hockey organization, let alone the general public across the globe. Yes, signs are getting better with the vaccinations and whatnot. And that's good, but it's not over yet. That's the thing. I don't understand why people don't get the fact that that the problem is, is that they they're just thinking that oh it's okay now because the numbers are going down will be good forever that's not how this works it's going to be a long time now as i move on from the vancouver canucks and the people that are kind of lowballing the effects of covid-19 like a bunch of turduckins what is this going to be now for the National Hockey League? See, I was able to turn this back into hockey. I went from baseball to COVID to hockey. That's how we turned it around. There is discussion now with the league, within the league, of A, what are we going to do with the Canucks? Because they may not play for two weeks, guys. That may be the case. That's my thing, okay? There may be possibilities out there of 
of a of just maybe them there is word that they may not play now the league wants them to play the players want to play of course they want to play the vancouver canucks they want i don't know if they'll be able to make up all these games that they're missing however my point is is that they there's a good chance if the if the symptoms don't come down and the tests don't come down for the team they may not be able to play the rest of the year now there is a lot of time left Remember this. There is a lot of time to play, I don't want to say, what, five to ten more games? I don't know. Now, yes, the Canucks are, well, they were falling off. They were they were a team that seemed like they were going to be in a playoff spot. Heck, I picked them to be in a playoff spot. But that may not be the case with this hockey club. So that's why I think it may be a little bit different, whereas if they can't, it w- if it seems like it would be too much of a risk to push them to play, they may not end up playing. Now, what does this have to do now? Because remember how Florida had a big issue in Buffalo. Despite the team being bad on the ice, they had a big COVID issue early on in the year. The Devils also had a big issue. Dallas had to miss the first two weeks of the season because of COVID. The Vegas Golden Knights, the St. Louis Blues. There have been problems all across the league with COVID. And the league is starting to think now that maybe they may have to go to a bubble system for the playoffs. Now, what does this mean in terms of now? how does it work? There are the multiple possibilities for COVID. There are or part, or for, for a bubble. There could be the, all right, let's just stick with the playoffs with the way it is now. Everyone's staying in their divisions and play within your cities. Because if unless you want to go for another two months of having folks go into a bubble for another three months like they did last year. At least three months for the teams that make it all the way to the finals. The players don't want that. The league doesn't want it. And the franchises don't want it because this is maybe their close opportunity for playoff revenue because of having, because of just the fact that they, the fans are allowed in the buildings. Now they're doing a lot better of a job than the Texas Rangers are right now, but I digress. But that said, if the league can't contain this virus, if the play teams can't contain this virus, you may be looking at, and I'm going to say this because of looking at the possibility of the final four and the Stanley Cup playoffs from one from each division. You may have to put that into a bubble. You may have to put that into one city, into one arena, whether it be in the United States, Canada, whatever. You may have to do that. Because, especially if, say, the team that comes from the North Division ends up making it to the finals. There's already people talk back when the Leafs were knocking everyone's doors down. There was like, oh my gosh, the Leafs are having to play in Buffalo during the playoffs. That's still a possibility, by the way, guys. There's still a possibility that if, say, Edmonton makes it to the Final Four, or Montreal, or Winnipeg, that they may have to come down to Minnesota or go down to California to play or go over, you know, if you're Montreal, have to go down to Buffalo to play or whatnot or New York to go play. Those are huge possibilities right now for the Canadian, for the team coming from the Canadian North Division, from the Scotia North Division, excuse me. Now, what does that mean, though? But why would a, or how is the bubble come into effect for this? If the numbers come back to the point where the league doesn't find it safe that they'll be traveling, because here's the thing. When those final four comes around, you're going to, if you want to have teams play each other in their home barns, you may have a case. We'll just go hypothetical here. We'll say, we'll, we'll just go the top teams in the division right now. Say Toronto, Vegas, Tampa, and is it New York today? I think the Islanders are right now in first place. Islanders are the four teams. If the league goes with the idea of having the one to four system, the best team in the league versus the fourth best team in the, or the, of the four teams, whoever had the worst record, and then two versus three. Because here's the thing, that may be the case because Vegas is the only team off the eastern seaboard then, is what you're looking at in the playoffs. So what are you going to have Vegas versus, I think Toronto's the worst of this. So it'll be Vegas versus Toronto. Say Toronto comes down and plays in Buffalo. Then you have them traveling between Vegas, which is opening up Vegas, and Buffalo. Not really wrong in Buffalo, just the team that actually plays at first Niagara Center is not doing well so well right now. And then you're going to have the Islanders from New York and Florida, which is just full of COVID right now in both spectrums. 
you're going to have those two go just flip-flop back and forth. Now, granted, yes, that's the eastern seaboard or whatever. I don't know. I just I feel like now we're trending towards the path of having bubbles and or having at least a bubble for the final four. You may keep it within the division. Say Toronto plays Montreal, Winnipeg plays Edmonton. You may have them go back between their cities. I'm pretty sure the league is looking at that as a possibility because then that'll be great. They're like, okay, less travel between Edmonton and Winnipeg, province side by side. Same thing with Montreal and Toronto. I'm pretty sure the league right now is hoping for that. They're trying to find a way to limit travel as much as possible. So I I don't exactly know how a bubble would work, where it would go. I'm pretty sure the league now is just, they're planning to, they're they're planning for the worst, I'm sure. But I don't think they, they're, they're trying everything they can to make sure that doesn't happen. That right now, I think is the plan here. And this is, remember what we talked about all during the pandemic guys and during the pause. It is, we talked about that there's a group of people working on a schedule for one, for an area where we may have to have a bubble or where Canadian teams have to play in the States or where Canadian teams have to stay in Canada and the United States teams have to play down in their own cities and whatnot in their own regions, which that's where we are now. But I'm saying that the league has people working on every different scenario that they're thinking of, of how they'd make it work. They may all go to Buffalo. Buffalo has shown in the past that it is a great spot for World Junior tournaments, other national tournaments, other international tournaments, U18s, all that sort of thing. It's a great spot for having teams travel and have to bubble into one area. Obviously, we saw it in Canada last year, both in Toronto and Edmonton. Now, granted, the thing is, is that everyone south of the borders, it's, they're doing a much better job of vaccinating than people are up in Canada right now. So there is that to kind of have in the back of our minds as we think of where a possible bubble location would be. Now, of course, like I said, they may just have it be, we're like, all right, first two rounds, everyone in their own division, everyone in their own region, travel's okay. Everyone play in their home barns. Like I said, the goal is the fact that they're hoping that the numbers come back to where it's favorable to have people travel for the semifinals and finals. And once again, it's going to be a bummer because no matter who comes out of Canada, at this point, at this rate, they'll have to play in the United States somewhere. So there is, unfortunately, that to look at. And it's going to be tough to get folks from Canada to come down because then they have to go back up to Canada and have to sit out 14 days. And I don't know if people are going to go to one playoff game in Buffalo or Minnesota just to have to go back up and sit for two weeks out of work after they pretty much spent a week or two's pay for a playoff game and travel. So there is that to consider moving forward. So that's pretty much it for the COVID page right now. That is obviously the big part. Oh, wait, I almost forgot about Dallas last night. Dang, I almost forgot about that, kids. So, Rick Bonus, <laughs> the head coach of the Dallas Stars, almost forgot about this story, kids. Carolina yesterday beats Dallas one to nothing. Peter Mrazek, first game back since January, by the way, gets a shutout. Last two starts, he's had shutouts. He had a shutout in the game yesterday against the Dallas Stars, and... A shout-out with the Chicago Wolves, a 42-save shout-out, I think it was, against the Grand Rapids Griffins in his rehab start. Had a pretty good game. Peter Mrazek's pretty good. So there, so he has a great start. But anyways, the, the big story that really came out of it was that Rick Bonus just didn't show up on the bench in the third period. Okay, well, that's a little interesting. What's wrong with Rick Bonus? Found finds out after the game, or found we found out halfway through the third period. Eric Bonus was pulled off the bench in the third period due to COVID precaution. Because apparently, Rick Bonus is, according to Jim Nill and his postgame presser, general manager of the Dallas Stars, the fact that Rick Bonus had tested positive on a PCR test for COVID-19. Now, Jim Nill confirmed that pretty much the entire Dallas Stars roster and the traveling group which includes coaches and players, had been fully vaccinated. So that's why they're thinking this whole thing with Rick Bonus is a false positive. And I can, I'm not going to guarantee you right now, folks, but the stats with PCR tests is that they are, uh, they're pretty accurate. So my thing is this, how there have been issues in the, this season with the COVID testing and how it can be a little inconsistent. I wonder how they test for COVID-19 with the rapid test to get into the rink, which I think is still a thing, where they do the 15-minute rapid antigen testing, how does it get into the arena and the PCR comes back later? Like, did they not time the PCRs right? Because take those typically take two to three to four days to come back, those results. 
So how does that exactly work out? For 40 minutes, Rick Bonus is on the bench yelling and probably doing what most coaches do, pull their mask down to yell on the ice or whatever, because with the mask, you can't yell as far, and that's what they've been doing. They pull the mask down, they yell across the ice, and they put it back up. So the guy that was yelling from the bench, probably, unless Rick Bonus had a calm game. I didn't watch it in detail. I didn't know. I didn't see exactly what Rick Bonus did from start to finish. But what I'm just saying is most likely he had to yell a couple times out of the ice. So that guy was on Monday in the first two periods. And then all of a sudden, oh, Rick, you tested positive. You got to get off. What? Can you imagine being on the bench saying, like, where's coach? Oh, he tested positive for COVID. What? Does the scout door. What? What do you mean he tested positive? He's been on the bench for the 40 minutes here. Well, his PCR test came back in the middle of the game. I. <laughs> that's my biggest thing is, like, how messed up is the testing here with the league that all of a sudden halfway through the game, you're going to pull a guy off or, or remember the, um, uh, Justin Turner, speaking of at global, I feel they had the world series last year, Justin Turner halfway through was a game six of the world series or game seven or whatever. The, the game, the clinching game, he has to get pulled off the field because he tested positive or his COVID test came back positive. Like I, if you're going to do these PCR tests, I, I, I get it, they're most likely accurate, but you got to find a way to time these out so you don't have a guy test positive in the middle of a game. I know it's hard to do, especially in baseball where they're playing just about every day, but in hockey especially, like how... Now they're saying that, like I said, Jim Neal says they're hoping it's a false positive. Well, you better hope it is, because or else you're going to have an issue. Now we're going to have to quarantine, you have to test the heck out of everybody three times a day probably to make sure that everyone's healthy enough to play or else... Dallas Stars are back on the shelf with a COVID quarantine once again, as they had in the beginning of the season. We talked about that already. So COVID, unfortunately, folks, like I said, it's still here. It's still going to be around for a while, and it's still causing havoc across the National Hockey League. With that, I'll be honest, I thought that was going to go a little bit worse in terms of me yelling and screaming because I wasn't too pleased with the Rangers right now and whatnot, dooms of COVID-19. But that, I digress. So with that, let's, uh, let's take a break here. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, we'll talk, we'll get to the college game. It's a little bit less, uh, a little less hectic. Some predictions will be made that may, may change the course of college hockey forever. We'll just have to wait and see. We will talk about that and more when we come back on The Kula Show here on 12 Out Sports. And welcome back to the Kewl Show, everyone, here on this Monday, April the 5th. I almost made that mistake earlier about saying March. It is April here in 2021, the second longest year ever. Actually, no, 2021 hasn't, hasn't been ridiculously long. It's just been, you know, same old story, right? Just different year. A couple things to get to here before we hit college hockey. Of course, if you're following, if you're watching on YouTube channel, you saw my dad chiming in with the old, or the Kewl Quest chiming in with the big win for the Red Wings yesterday. The Red Wings somehow defeat the Tampa Bay Lightning by a score of 5-1 to one 
in Tampa. The last time, guys, the Detroit Red Wings won a game in uh, Amelie Arena was back when it was the St. Pete Times form back in 2011. They had gone 0-16-1 in that building. I think that's the correct record. In that building, but they finally win. Are you kidding me? 0-16-1 in their last 17 in that barn in Tampa. And it was a convincing win. They pressured hard. Now, yes, Chris Gibson was the goaltender for Tampa. The, the Lightning, I would say, took it up, but it looked like a Tampa Bay Lightning team that did not want to play that game. They thought it was pretty dumb. The, the, yes, the Faja is here. Yes, my dad is there. Dad is watching on the YouTube. Probably confusing the heck out of the people that are listening right now. What do you mean? Well, if you... Well, if you're listening to the podcast for him, you can catch us live Monday nights from 6 to 8.30 every single Monday night, live on the YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook, and Zingo TV of 12 Ounce Sports, which is where we are right now. So, now what does it have to do, though, or the Red Wings? It's kind of interesting because the Detroit Red Wings, who are not the worst team in the National Hockey League somehow, they are a, they're a competitive hockey team. Mark Stahl scored in that game. Uh, who else scored in that game? I'm trying to think off the top of my head. I'm not going to bother pulling up the box score. But I just found it really funny because people are like, oh my gosh, Tampa, they stink now. They lost to Detroit. Listen, like I said, they start their third string goaltender because it wasn't Vasilevsky. It wasn't McElhaney. It was Chris Gibson, former Toronto Maple Leafs prospect, if you can go that far back. I remember because he was with the Marlies, and when he played for the Marlies, he stunk. Or at least he stuck when he played the Griffins, which was the only time I really ever watched the Marlies back in those days. So, anyways, big win for Detroit. Obviously, they're not going to be the the best, uh, or at least the most favorite team in the lottery. They won't have the best odds. However, they'll still be around. However, the Detroit Red Wings are in the middle of an interesting spot right now. They are a hockey club that has a, well, I don't want to say a great chance to make some hay near the trade deadline. Like I said, we're one week removed from the trade deadline. But they have some players that they could possibly move around a little bit. I, you know, I was listening to Hockey Central today, and Jeff Merrick and Je- Justin Bohr made good points that, you know, there's Mo Sider, there's Lucas Raymond, and Dylan Larkin, and he was talking about pretty much everyone else after that's fair game, you would think. Because while they are competitive, who knows how long it's going to take for this team to be good again. Thomas Grice, I don't... He's not going to be like your goaltender of the future forever. That's the hard part with a guy like him. Jonathan Bernier, he is perfect in the role he plays. He plays goal every so often and does okay. He's a veteran backup. He's perfect for the spot that he has. Uh, for Detroit, I, are they the new Nashville? And by that, I mean, are they the team that may be the, the team that's going to probably be pushing players around a little bit? Because remember how we were all talking with when we had Peyton Turns. Not the last time, not last week, we had or, Last week, last week we had him on a couple weeks before when we were all going, oh my gosh, Nashville are going to get rid of everybody. Philip Forsberg is gone. Matthias Eckholm is gone. Ryan Ellis is gone. Everyone's gone. Everybody but, you know, Roman Yossi and Pecorine because no one's going to want Pecorine's contract. But now Detroit's looking like that team that may be the big sellers. I don't see any of the Canadian teams making big moves because obviously Vancouver is in a little bit of a pickle like we talked about earlier. And... Calgary is still uncertain about what the heck they are after losing another one last night to Toronto. Detroit, in terms of young players that can play now, they're like I said, there's Anthony Mantha. Anthony Mantha, who has been a big part of that team in terms of least of offensive production. Bobby Ryan has been a name that's got tossed around a little bit. But, you know, are they going to be the team that's going to be big sellers here at the deadline? As of right now, let me check my Twitter just to make sure I haven't missed anything as of yet because it could be the case where, you know, there may be something that moves around. Um, nothing yet right now in terms of movements. By the way, Eric Stahl making his debut tonight in, in Montreal. Like we said, we're going to have that game on shortly after the Jays and Rangers wrap up here in the studio. Or, or Canadians hosting Edmonton. Edmonton's had a few days off because they were supposed to play Vancouver this past weekend, and they didn't. Montreal can bounce back after a tough loss to Ottawa last week, a 6-3 decision to the Ottawa Senators. Ottawa taking on Winnipeg tonight. That'll be later on this evening. So, but as of right now, nothing on the trade front as of yet, but Detroit may be the big sellers. Now, the big question everyone's been asking is who is going to be the biggest buyer? 
that's been the real tough question for, for myself, too, because typically it's like, oh, the team that has the best chance to win the cup, right? Or the team that is one or two pieces away. You're looking at a team like Colorado, who is, despite having goaltender injuries up the wazoo, just seemingly is able to compete and be one of the best teams. People, Some people are even asking, will Minnesota be the team now to be looking to move at the deadline? I think Minnesota should just play with the house money they have because they have two really good goaltenders, Capo Kacken and Cam Talbot, best tandem in the league so far this season. I'm not going to let anyone tell me any different. They have been outstanding from the get-go, which is a bummer because I was on the Alex Stalock train in the offseason thinking, yes, Devin Dubnik's gone. Stay locked for starter. It's going to be great. And they signed Cam Talbot. I'm like, okay, well, that may work <laughs> because Talbot ended up taking the job from Dave Riddick last year, heading into the playoffs for Calgary. And so far, those two goaltenders have worked, meshed really well, and they've done a better job than Yarrow Halak, who, by the way, is also out in COVID protocol right now for Boston, which is why Swayman and Vladar will get these starts tonight. Tuka Rask is skating, but he's injured. But... But Rask and you know, Halak have not been the same as they have been in the past. And that now gives the starting, at least the best tandem right now in the league, arguably, to guys like, um, I lost my train of thought, <laughs> to Kak- Kapo Kakinen and number 33, Cam Talbot. Those two goaltenders have been arguably the best goaltenders in the league right now. And I, I truly think that... Um, that those two are going to make a difference. And that's why I don't think Minnesota should make any moves because a cap right now is going to make it really hard um, moving forward in terms of just making moves and having money to make moves. That's going to be the hard part moving forward here because like I, I really want to see, I want to see teams make moves obviously because trade deadline is always fun to follow. But it's a pain in the butt to follow when you have it on all day and you can't do anything about it because, well, uh, it's hard to do it when there's no trades and no one's able to make any money off of it. That, I think, is the hard part in all of this because if no one's willing to make a move, no one's willing to trade, it's going to make it very boring when you have eight hours of television. So I don't know exactly what each team is going to do. Now, people are like, oh, Vegas. I'm like, no, Vegas has no money. People are like, Colorado. I'm like, well, what what does Colorado what does Colorado need? They just need to play a full sixty minutes for my if for, if you're asking me. Colorado has the talent: McKinnon, Landeskog, Kadri, Chushkin. They have the goaltending. They have the defense. They just sometimes lay an egg. They just need to find a way to play a full sixty minutes on a consistent basis. That's why they lost last season. They went and took Dallas for granted and then got hammered. In that series, they had to rely on Michael Hutchinson to get him to game seven. No, that's because Pavel Francouz and Philip Grubauer have both gotten hurt the last couple of games. But you know what I'm saying? That's my point that I'm trying to make here, guys, is Colorado has the, they had the tools to win last year. They have the tools to win again this year, but they need to find a way to play a full 60. They don't need a player to figure it out. Maybe if you want to look at the Leafs aspect and how they have all these veteran players, that's why these teams are, why the Leafs are able to win these games that typically in years past they would lose. Last night's Calgary, last season they would have lost that game. Didn't play well, didn't look interested, but they found a way to grind out a win. That is what the difference has been for the Leafs. The Avs, though, they have the talent right now. They have the players to be game changers. Do they have the pedigree? Do they have the... The sandpaper that some teams want, you would think so with a guy like Nazem Kadri. Devin Tates can play a little tough every so often. They have guys in the back end that can play rough. Do they have the pedigree? Do they have the long-term, you know, the veteran, you know, the veteran skill set that the Lightning were able to build last season with guys like Bogosian and Shen that had some miles on their legs, but they were able to use that experience for the younger kids like, you know, the Barclay Goudreaux and Blake Coleman's who ended up playing big roles in their own right. And that's what I'm saying. Like, does Colorado have that? Maybe not, but they have the talent to get to the conference final. And I don't want to look at it and say, oh, Colorado is going to have to wait another couple of years to win the Stanley Cup. I'm not going to make that pick again. Like I did with the Lightning in 2019. Congratulations, 2020 Stanley Cup. No, I don't see Colorado in that realm yet. Colorado hasn't been good enough for as long as Tampa was before having it be the case where 
they are a team that's destined to finally win. So, regardless on that aspect, I, I, don't, I don't think Colorado can make many moves. Philadelphia has been, right now, an interesting look because of the fact that, well, they, uh, uh, they kind of stink. <laughs> Carter Hart played a good game the other night against, oh gosh, who was it? Islanders. They played the Islanders, and that was and it was a great game by New York. They ended up playing well and ended up out being out playing Philly enough. But Carter Hart looked good. But look at it this way: Tampa won't make any moves. Now, granted, Tampa's won a cup. I don't think they are a team that's going to go buy at the deadline like crazy to find a way to win back-to-back cups. I don't see them doing that. St. Louis, they're going on the reverse end right now, but they don't have any cap room. As I go towards the bottom, in terms of teams that are right now hunting for a playoff spot, Florida is the team that in terms of that's in a playoff spot right now and is looking good, they have the most cap room right now out of all teams that are in the playoffs. San Jose, who is, watch out, we'll get to what to watch for us here in just a little bit, but there's a team that could be a playoff team here in a moment. Carolina is also up there, but Florida has right now almost $3 million in cap space. Now, what are they going to have to give up to get players? It all depends on who they want to get, obviously, because you don't want to give up many players. I mean, because they have so many like unsung here, like Noel Achari, Alex Wenberg, Frank Vitrano, who played a good game yesterday in a win over Columbus. I'm about to say like, Chicago? No, they didn't play Chicago. Chicago didn't play yesterday. But, of course, you have the big guns, Huberdeau, Barkov, and, of course, some kid named Carter Verhage, who I'm pretty sure no one's ever heard of before this season. No, I'm kidding. He's, you know, people know who he is. For them, I think, for if you're looking at Florida, what, what they would need, because Chris Drieger is playing really well, they have Spencer Knight skating with them, Boston College goaltender, their prospect. He may be a guy that heck, may get a game here in a moment. I don't see him going down in the American League. But they, and yes, Sergei Bobrovsky is making $10 million, but Sergei Bobrovsky is taking a backseat right now to the kids because he hasn't been playing well. The only thing I can think of is maybe a goal or a defenseman. You have a guy like Keith Yandel. You have, it's veteran presence. That's what you want back there. Playoff veteran presence, maybe not so much, but. He knows what it's like to play for years upon years upon years. Anton Strawman, yeah, he, he was there when the Lightning were a good regular season team, but he wasn't able to turn into much playoff success. Mackenzie Weger, same thing. Rad Kogutas played on a rough Philadelphia team for a while, and I meant both rough as in not winning and rough as in literally trying to fight every single night. Rad Kogutas. Uh, Matt Kirsten, who just signed with the team coming out of North Dakota. He's a big defenseman that could play some big minutes here. Down the stretch, if he can, you know, maybe if they, they give him a real chance. Former Chicago Steel, Matt Kirsch said, by the way. And also have Gustav Forsling, a young left-handed defenseman. So there, there is a young group there, but I think if you want to find a way to make this team just a little bit better, because they're playing out of their minds right now. Now, how they play in a playoff series, I don't know, because the, the Panthers haven't been in the playoffs for five years. So I can't say that Florida is going to be, oh my gosh, this seems going to be great. They're going to make it all the way to the conference finals because they're going to, beat Tampa because Tampa doesn't care anymore and there's no one else in the Central Division that will care except for Carolina. I'm not going to say that. Like, in, in terms of looking at that Central Division, out of the teams that are right now in the playoff hunt, the team that I'm scared about the most is Carolina. Simply because of the fact that, like I said, Tampa, they won last year. Yes, they're good again this year, and they have probably the Norris and the Vesna Trophy gold trophy winning players on their team. They're doing this all without Nikita Kucherov, by the way. Tampa is. That said, I just think Carolina has a bigger chip on their shoulder. That's why I think Carolina's gonna be so dangerous, and that's why I think they're gonna be the team that come out of the Central Division. But if Florida wants to get there, if they want to be a legit favorite, yes, they're playing great hockey right now. They are looking studly right now. They need to find a tough veteran defenseman. I don't really know where they're going to get it, though. That's the hard part for me. Because I don't think Philadelphia is going to make any big moves. I don't think, because they're still, I mean, that team played really well last year. Philadelphia did. Carter Hart was out of his mind last year. There still is that capability. They still have Voracek. They still have Giroux, Provorov, Konechny. The, the talent's going to be there for some time in Philadelphia. I don't think that's, that's why I don't think, you know, if you're Philly, you're not making crazy moves right now 
because you know that you have talent that can, you know, I say next year, if they falter, if they look like this again next year, you'll see a lot of it. You'll see maybe a selling team there in Philadelphia. I don't know if what Detroit's going to want or what Detroit you can get from Detroit. I don't want to say go after Mark Stahl because, listen, Mark Stahl is Mark Stahl, and he's a liability defensively. This is not 2014 Mark Stahl, like I said. This is not a Mark Stahl that has value in terms of getting traded. So don't go crazy looking for him. I, I don't know what Florida could get for in Los Angeles. Yes, there's Drew Doughty, but at that point, you have to give up cash. So you're going to have to give up players. You're going to have to give up cap space to get a guy like Drew Doughty. If you're looking at a team possibly like Anaheim, you know, who can you really get on the defensive end there? As I go quickly over the thing, they they have Kevin Shattenkirk for 3.9 for the next three seasons, and he had a little bit of a career revitalization last season with the Bolts. Did really well, played big minutes in the playoffs for them at times. But, you know, you want guys like him around if you're Dallas Akins and if you're Anaheim because you have young guys like Jamie Drysdale that are trying to develop into, you know, everyday NHLers and Jacob Larson. And you still have guys like Josh Manson and Cam Thought. It's not a bad decor in Anaheim. They just, they're just so inconsistent. They're, they're very young as well. They have, a, they have a very wide range of old guys like Bacchus and Getzloff and Reek. And then you have the young kids like Zegris and Drysdale. So... And I almost said Sammy Carrick, but I'm like, that's a little bit old. Maxime Comtois is another one um, who's a guy who's actually had a pretty good year for Anaheim. I don't think that he's going to be a guy that's moved. A, he's also got an ELC. So it's another thing with Anaheim. So going Florida, looking at Florida, it'll be tough. It'll be tough for Florida to try to find what they need. Because offensively, they're gifted. They got it. But I just don't think the, the chops are there for this team in terms of being tough, being gritty in the playoffs. That'll be their downfall. They may win a round. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna count them out on that aspect. They may win a playoff round. I just don't know if they're gonna be deep enough, tough enough, and worn enough to make it far. Even though they have the ability to make moves. So we'll just say and Bill Zito, very aggressive. This is his first year with the club, of course, since coming down to Columbus, first year general manager in the NHL was an assistant GM with Yarma Kekalainen, who you kind of saw pretty much a guy that just put his entire job on the line, keeping or going for Matt Duchesne and keeping Panera and keeping Bobrovsky that year. And Partner almost did it had it not been for Brad Marchand, sucker punching guys in the back of the head. My goodness, that Columbus team. That team almost did it, guys. They almost did it. So it'll be interesting to see what happens at the deadline. Let's hit the books now, shall we? As I say that, because, hey, get it? Hit the books, because college. It's funny. College hockey. And so let's get to what do I want to go with first. Do you want to go with Hobie Baker talk or Frozen Four Piece? Let's do Hobie Baker's first. Those, that's that's going to be, I think, the biggest part because obviously one of the guys that is a Hobie Baker candidate is in the Frozen Four. And two of them are not because they lost in the regionals. No guy, I don't, that's a really, really good question. Has there ever been a, well, I guess Jeremy Swayman last year, that's right. Let's see, has there ever been a guy that has not made the, re, well, I don't know if Maine would have, because of course, last year we didn't even get to the postseason. I'm trying to think of the last Hobie Baker hat trick finalist that was not on a tournament team, because I don't think Maine would have made it last year. And not, I'm not saying that's knocking Jeremy Swayman. That's because of the fact that Maine was just not that good. But let's look at the three we have this year. First one we're going to lead off with Shane Pinto from North Dakota. Here, here's my thing with, oh Lord, don't get, don't get out. Make that grab, make that grab. Oh, what? Oh, he dropped it. Dang it. Oh, uh, Randall Gritchick almost made a game ending home run saving catch. He knocked it down, but Texas scores a run. 6-2 in the bottom of the ninth, by the way, there in Arlington. For those that are still following the Jays game with me here. Uh, Dulles is on the mound. Guy that can throw 95 mile an hour fastball and a 89 mile an hour changeup. <laughs> but um, great slider though, too. Anyway, Shane Pinto from North Dakota, he, man, it's it's tough for me with Shane Pinto because I thought Jordan Kawaguchi was going to have another Hobie Baker caliber season, which he did. He actually had more points than Shane Pinto, if I'm not mistaken. Let's see if I can quick pull this up here for you folks, because I had I had the numbers up earlier. I ended up getting rid of them, though, because I'm a dummy. <sighs> so let me see if I can quick pull them up for you, kids. Let's go here to the national 
Thanks. Because Shane Pinto finished tied for ninth with Alex Steves. By the way, Alex Steves, who signed with the Toronto Maple Leafs after getting knocked out with Notre Dame, or by the by getting knocked out, I mean not being able to play because of COVID issues. Pinto, Ottawa draft pick, who actually signed with the Senators, by the way, had 15 goals, 17 assists for 32 points in 29 games. Very respectable. No, or 28 games, excuse me. Very good game, or very exceptional season. However, Jordan Kawaguchi, who was last year a Hobie, a Hobie hat trick finalist, had 10 goals, 26 for 36 points in the same amount of games. That right there, I think, for me is tough. That's why I'm not picking Shane Pinto to win this award this year. I think there's a good general consensus on who is going to win the Hobie Baker Award. We'll get to him in just a moment. But that that's tough for me because I thought Kawaguchi really redeemed himself, and it was unfortunate that he had to play in the same year. I thought Kawaguchi was going to win it last year, to be honest with you. I Scott Perunovich was a, is a, an excellent two-way defenseman, but, man, I don't know. I... I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure if I brought Pat Micheletti right on the show right now and asked about Scott Perunovich, you'd probably hear the reason why he won the Hobie Baker Award. And obviously, he deservedly won it as well. But I thought Kawaguchi may have been the guy last year. And that's why I thought Kawaguchi was going to get the look again this year. And maybe Odin Tufto, because he was having a great year with Quinnipiac. But obviously, the ECAC gets overlooked because it's not a Power Four conference, so whatever. So... Anyways, Pinto gets nominated. I don't think he's going to win, but he had a great year with North Dakota, unfortunately getting knocked out in that five-overtime classic against Minnesota Duluth in the Fargo Regional. Now, the other guy, the, the general consensus, is Cole Caulfield. Signed with the Montreal Canadiens after the season, after an incredible year where he led the country in goals and points, and goals per game and points per game. So don't give me this whole... Oh, but he may have played more games than some teams. No, in points per game and goals per game, led the country. 30 goals, 22 assists, 52 points in 31 games played. He averaged almost a goal per game, 0.97 goals per game, and 1.68 points per game. And also, he's got a brother, by the way, Brock Caulfield. He's having a good year. He had a good year as well for the Badgers. He's the guy that's probably going to win it. I get that. He's had a great year, led the country in just about everything offensively. 11 power play goals, 24 power play points. I, I mean, he had a, he had 165 shots on goal. All right, that led the country. You want to know who had se- who was second? With 141, Cameron Wright from Bowling Green, who also had a great year as well. Just couldn't find the back of the net as much as everyone else. But my thing is, Cole Caulfield, he's so dynamic. He's so good. There were whispers that he was going to go to Montreal after his freshman season. And not even a full year. When Wisconsin was awful, Cole Caulfield was still a star with the Badgers. Comes back this year, has a great year. That's why he's like, you know what? I'm going to go. I'm going to go to the NHL. That's why I'm just going to jump out of here and say, you know what? I don't need this college anymore. I'm going to go to the NHL. And as of right now, he's listed to be with the Laval Rocket, but he's probably going to be in the NHL here in just a little bit. So, by the way, that game is just getting underway. Montreal and Edmonton will get that on TV. Still 6-2 here in the bottom of the ninth. Two outs, two on, or no, one on, 2-2 two, two pitch from Dulles to Tavares. Not Tavares, Tavares. Or Tavares. Is it Tavares? I didn't hear it. His last name. He's pinch hitting right now for the Rangers. So, who is texting me again? Why are people texting me? Cooper, what? When are, oh, why is Cooper texting me this? Oh, he's probably asking because he probably wants to hang out and watch the Frozen or the Final Four. Strike three, called, and the Jays win. Jays win six to two with a Globe Life Field, the packed Globe Life Field, because COVID doesn't matter there in Texas, apparently. Regardless, Jays win. They are now four or three and one on the season. So back to Cole Caulfield. Great player, dynamic, amazing. He's probably going to win it. But that carries me now to my pick for the Hobie Baker Award. But Tyler, your pick, what are you doing? How could you not pick with everyone else? Because A, I'm different, and B, this kid deserves it. Dryden McKay of Minnesota State. Now, why? Why, Tyler? Why? Why are you doing this? Why are you picking him? Why would you ever do such a thing? Well, because, kids, I really think that he showed this year that he is the best goaltender in the NCAA. Now, now, yes, that pretty much is my reasoning why he's, I mean, he's going to win the Mike Richter award. I don't think anyone has a doubt that 
Dryden McKay is going to be the Mike Richter Award winner. Same thing with Jeremy Swayman last year. Simply because of the fact that he's nominated for the Hobie Baker Award just puts him in that realm of being the guy for the Richter Award. Here are some of Dryden McKay's numbers. Here are his numbers, actually, this season. He went 21-3. and three. Most wins. By the way, right now, three and a half minutes in Montreal, Edmonton, not up at zero. At Center Jabel in Montreal. He went 21-3, and three, most wins of any goaltender in college hockey. 1.39 goals against average. Not the best. 0.931 save percentage. Still not the best. I think he was sixth, if I'm not mistaken. I'm going to click that right now just to make sure because I looked it up earlier and I didn't write down where he was in the standings because, once again, Tyler is a dummy, folks. But at one point during this season, and I'll be honest, it all changed with one game against Ferris State. He had a sub- one goals against average. I think he was like 0.79 goals against average. He had better numbers than Aaron Frankel at one point, guys. Northeastern Patty Kazmaier winner. His 931 save percentage is sixth in the country. His goals against average of 1.39 was second in the country behind Philip Lindbergh of Massachusetts. Minnesota Wild draft pick, by the way. We'll get to them him in just a second. He had 10 shutouts. 10 shutouts in a season. It's not the most of all time. However, still, that's ridiculous. 10 shutouts in one season. Now, you can say, oh, it's because that's how Minnesota State plays. Like I said, we'll get to them in just a minute how the team in front of them is because they are in the Frozen Four. They're the only, out of the three guys that are here, he's the only one that's left standing. At least his team is. He is two behind Ryan Miller for most all time in a career. Now, yes, Ryan Miller did it in three seasons, his 26 shutouts, So there's going to be that against him because I think, as far as I know from people I've talked to, Dryden McKay will come back for his senior season. Oh, yeah, he's a junior, by the way. (laughs) You remember that? So there's a good chance he may, knock on wood, break it next year, break the record. Because the CCHA that Minnesota State will be playing in is pretty much the WCHA with St. Thomas being added to it. My thing is this. The reason why people are like, oh, but look at the team in front of Dryden McKay. Why should he win when the team in front of him is so good? Dryden McKay didn't have any workload this year. Let's look at how many times he had to make over 30 saves this season. I'm looking, I'm counting right now. I'm at one. Yes, you're right. In one game, he had to make 30 plus saves. Not even the overtime win against Quinnipiac in the first round of the tournament. Not even in that game did he have to make 30 plus saves. He made 30 saves and a 4-0 shutout, shocky, against Bowling Green back in February. So what does this have to do with McKay? Well, Mike, okay, Tyler, if he's only making this number of saves, what the heck? Or he only has to make this number of saves every game. Like, what makes him so good? Why was Kenny Dryden always the Vesna winner? Why was Marty Berdour consistently a Vesna winner? Do you want to pull up those guys' numbers when they played with Kenny Dryden was in that amazing flying Frenchman Montreal team with Guy Lapointe, Serge Savard, Larry Robinson, Bob Gainey, the best defensive forward in the history of hockey? He faced like 10 shots a game. But what made him so good? Because of the fact that when those 10 shots came down, no matter, because goaltenders can be good when they get 35 to 40 shots a game. They get consistent work. But the ability to come up big when you only have to make 18 saves a game, 16 saves a game, 20 saves a game, that is a special ability that is so overlooked so often. Now, yes, on this show, when we did our college hockey scoreboard, I highlight, oh, look at this, Emil Zetterquist for Colgate, coming up big, or no, St. Lawrence, excuse me, St. Lawrence, Emil Zetterquist, coming up big, making 35 saves. Isaiah Seville for Omaha, Stonewall in North Dakota, making 46 saves. Yeah, that's, those, that's awesome. Those are big numbers. But Dryden McKay, we men- I mentioned at least once a weekend, it seemed like. Shut up for Dryden McKay. Make it six on the year. Make it seven on the year. Make it eight on the year. Dryden McKay was making shots. The only game that he really had an issue, by the way, he only missed two games this season. The only game that I think people really started to wonder how good he was going to be was... The game against a the game against Ferris State where he got pulled, where Minnesota State ended up pulling it out, winning five four in overtime. 
still got the win to Dryden McKay. The overtime loss against Bemidji State on in March when he gave up four goals. And then giving up four goals in the 5-1 loss in the WCHA semifinals to Northern Michigan. The only three times... He only gave up three, four goals three times this year, guys. I don't care who you are. I don't care what level of hockey you play at. When you play over, almost 25 games in a season and you only give up four goals three times against teams like Bowling Green, who had one of the best conference, best offenses in the conference, Bemidji State, who plays everybody tough, it seems like, you should be recognized as arguably the best goaltender in hockey. I don't see why people aren't giving him a fair shake. People are looking at Shane Pinto over Dryden McKay. And is this the goaltender in me coming out and saying, oh my goodness, guys, look at the goaltender. Is that me? Is it? It sounds like me when I talk to people that don't watch hockey. Oh, of course, Tyler going on the hockey route. Now for hockey's sake. Oh, Tyler's going down the goaltender route because he's a goaltender. Look at his numbers. Look how good he was for as long as this part of the season. He has been a dominant goaltender. And this is not just this year. He was a Mike Richter nominee last year, guys. He has been good for the last couple of seasons. And he's probably going to be the starter, knock on wood, once again next season. And he's probably, knock on wood, going to be amazing again. When is this country going to realize that Dryden McKay is the best goaltender in the country and arguably one of the best players in the country? He's going to win the Mike Richter Award this year, deservedly so, and he should be considered. He may not win, but he should be given an honest look to be the Hobie Baker Award winner. I feel like I'm doing, I feel like this is a deja vu. I did the same thing last year with Jeremy Swayman, but I'm serious though. He has been a game changer. I, and I'm, listen, I can't say, oh, what if they had one of the other goaltenders play? Well, we, we don't know because they never played. That's my thing. It's not like, I mean, because Philip Lindbergh had to split time with Matt Murray. Not that Matt Murray. You mess is Matt Murray. But that's what I'm saying. Like, there, there have been other teams that have had to use multiple goaltenders. Boston College had to do it as well when Spencer Knight went away to the World Juniors. And they did admirably well for the most part. Spencer Knight had a couple of weird starts towards the end. Heck, that's why they ended up falling in the tournament this year. So, to that point, if you are the Hobie Baker voting committee, how do you not give Dryden McKay an honest chance to be the name that is said on Friday when they say, and the Hobie Baker award goes to Dryden McKay. First of all, I'll be the first ever Minnesota State player to do it. I I didn't look at the exact numbers. I'm pretty sure Dryden McKayden is one of the only guys to ever or get nominated for the award. Only Minnesota State player to ever get nominated for the award. As far as I know, I'm not quite sure on that. But he's been so good this year. He'll probably set the record for all-time shutouts next year because Mike Casey's teams will not change. He will he will he'll recruit the same kind of players. The same players with a talented offensive end and a defense that carries 20-pound hockey sticks. It, it's incredible. It, the, that he's a he's perfect fit for that team. And that's the same thing with that's why I mentioned Marty Berdur and Kenny Dryden. They were perfect goaltenders for their teams. Chico Resch was a great goaltender for the New York Islanders, but he wasn't Kenny Dryden. Because Chico Resch had to work. Kenny Dryden just had to come up big whenever the puck actually got to him. Same thing with Marty Berdur. Marty Berdur doesn't win 500 games if it's not for the fact that Jacques Lemaire was the coach for the Devils in the 90s. And then in Larry Robinson, when he coached in the 2000s, and then Pat Burns in 2003. That's the reason why the Devils were so successful, because they had a strategy that worked, and they had a goaltender that whenever the puck got through the defense, whenever somehow someone got by Scott Stevens and Scott Niedermeyer with both their, with all their limbs intact, and Kenny Danico, that Marty Berdur was there to make the stop. Happened all. He had seven shutouts in the playoffs at Marty Berdur. How many times did he have to make 40 saves? I don't think once. Doesn't matter. Dryden McKay makes big saves in this playoffs. How many times did he make 30 saves? Not a one. That's the story, though, with Dryden McKay. He doesn't need to put up 45 saves to be noticed. He doesn't need to put up a Ben Scriven 70 save night to get noticed. 
He made 18 saves and got a shutout. Made 22 saves, got a shutout. Made 16 saves, got a shutout. But what, didn't he make nine against Alabama Huntsville? Let me go back to his numbers here. Yep, nine saves. Oh, gave up one goal. But then he stopped 16 of 16 the next night. That's my thing. He may not have the microscopic numbers of a Jimmy Howard or a Ken Dryden when he was in Colgate. But the way he's able to make sure that Minnesota State has the best chance to win every night because he's always going to be there to make the save no matter what the score is, no matter how far Minnesota State's ahead, no matter if they're up by one, no matter if they're up by three, no matter if it's save number 15 or three, he's going to make the stop. That's why Dryden McKay should be the Hobie Baker Award winner. Now, he's not going to. Like I said, it's going to be Cole Caulfield. I don't think there's a single doubt in anyone's mind. But that's my take, and that's why I think Dryden McKay. That is me campaigning for Dryden McKay to be this year's Hobie Baker Award winner. I don't think I'm the only person in that group that thinks he's going to win. But I would like to hope that there's enough people that are going to give him actual looks and nods of approval and say, you know what? He was that good this year. Like I say, he's not going to because Hobie Baker awards are just against, (laughs) they're against goaltenders. There's a reason why Ryan Miller and Rob Sauber are the only two goaltenders to ever win the award. So it, it's, it's, it sucks. That's how it is. I I get it. Let me see if I can find it. Make sure. Cause I think it was, remember I did my lookup last year. He'd be the only third goaltender to ever win the award. Let me see Hobie Baker Award winners. Because I'm pretty sure it's only been three guys of all time. Or two goaltenders, he would be the third, would be Dryden McKay. Well, let's quick just cycle through here. Goaltenders, yep, Rob Stauber in 88 with the Minnesota Golden Gophers and Ryan Miller from the Michigan State Spartans. By the way, Eric Stahl playing with the Montreal Canadiens tonight in game one. Still 0-0 between Edmonton and Montreal in the first period. Connor McDavid, still in the game. We'll get to him in just a little bit, not for a good reason. So let's get to the Frozen Four, though, now. A couple big games coming up this weekend. First game on Thursday. Minnesota State, speaking of which, versus St. Cloud. The battle for Minnesota. Well, it may be the battle for Minnesota if we get to a different final. But there are three of the four teams are from the land of 10,000 lakes. Two of them are taking taking their shots at each other in the semifinal. St. Cloud State making their first appearance to the Frozen Four since 2013. Minnesota State becoming the first WCHA team since the realignment in 2013 to make it to the Frozen Four. This is big for both these programs because St. Cloud State has had the moniker of falling out in the first round, losing to AIC, losing to Ferris State, being the one seed and falling to the fourth seed. It's been their MO for since 2013, for almost a decade now. However, this year, the team that was not supposed to do well, the team that was supposed to get ransacked by Duluth, and by Denver, and by North Dakota. No chance. Well, they didn't get it all. They didn't get all the way. They made it to the semifinals in the NCHC, right? They made it to the semifinals, right? And now I'm confused now. Now I lost track. NCHC tournament, 21. Let me just quick look it up here. Yeah, lost or lost in the final, excuse me, to North Dakota. That's why they got in on the at-large bit, because they made it all the way to the NCHC final. However... They are looking like the team that is the team of destiny. And I say this, I'm like, the guys, this is the epitome of the Tampa Bay Lightning. Every year they become first place, they lose. They lose their number one seed. Number one seed lost. Number one seed lost. They come in as a little bit of an afterthought. They they weren't even ranked guys coming into the season, St. Cloud State. And now they have a chance to win one game and they're in the NCAA championship. By the way, in that 2013 appearance in the Frozen Four, lost in the semifinals. So, I mean, let me. You're, they're going to need their big guns. They're going to need v, VD Mietinen. Nick Perbix is going to have to come up big. Yami Kurnia, who played some real big minutes at times, played well in the regional tournament as well. But, of course, the big question, and we talked about this a little bit with Peyton Turnage after the regionals last weekend, or last Monday, David Rennick. Is he? Are we going to get the Rennick that we've seen over the first couple of games in this tournament, in the regional tournament, or are we going to get the Rennick that comes back from 
2019 and 2018, the one that chokes in the playoffs, chokes in the big games. Because if he can if he can do what he did in the first two games of this tournament and just be good enough to win, St. Cloud State has a good chance of playing for a national title on Saturday. However, if he falters, I don't think this St. Cloud team is as deep enough as they were to score their way out of a problem, which is why, of course, they lost in the tournament before because they were not able to score their way out of a problem, even though they had so many great, talented players. They don't have Ryan Paling anymore. They don't have the big guns anymore, but they have that chip on their shoulder with this group that, to be honest, was not going to be as... They were not nearly as good as they were last year anyways, the 2019. But this there's a lot of players that are from that 2018-19 team that lost to AIC that is like, all right, we need to get this done for the program, for ourselves to show that we were one of the best teams in the country and we are now the best team in the country because they want to give themselves a shot to win a national title. But they are going up against a Minnesota State team that if they get out in front... Watch out. Mike Hastings has done an incredible job all career, (laughs) his entire career pretty much, of showing that he puts together teams that are tough to play defensively. It's from Dryden McKay out. You have guys like Akito Horosi and Jack McNeil in the back end. And then up front, you have Cade Borchard and Julian Dupravnik and Dallas Gerards or Gerards, who is able to put the puck in the back of the net, but also play well defensively. I was fortunate enough to go watch Minnesota State when I called the game to the Ferris State. And despite that, like I said, that was the 5-4 game, the game that McKay got pulled, but there were some points in that game you just saw Minnesota State just tell Ferris that they were not coming in their own zone. The next night especially, I wasn't there for the next night, but I looked, I watched it back, and, oh, it was miserable. And we talked about with Peyton Turner. They got, nine sh- they got 10 shots in a game. Alabama Huntsville did. Peyton barely remembers them scoring because they never had the puck in the Minnesota State zone. That's just how good they are. They have the ability to shut down the opposition's top units. They were able to hold off this Bowling Green attack for the first half of the season that was tearing through the country. And they said, "Niet, one goal in two games. They have a, such a tough defensive structure to break through. And St. Cloud, while they have the ability, I don't think... It's so tough because St. Cloud State has is on this run of redemption. And that's what makes them terrifying to go up against in this Frozen Four. Minnesota State has this, you know, us against the world mentality because they are from the WCHA. And since the realignment, since Minnesota and Wisconsin all left and North Dakota left and the NCHC became a thing, the WCHA has not been nearly as tough or is not as widely respected as it used to be back in the day. And this being the last year of the WCHA, of course, unfortunately, Lake State, the WCHA champions bowed out in the regionals. Minnesota State has something to prove and say, listen, we are for real. They finally won a game in the national tournament and they make the Frozen Four in the process. It's a mixture of team that has the chip on their shoulder versus the team that has something to prove. Now, yes, that sounds like a similarity. It sounds like these two teams are running the same route. And kind of they are. Except St. Cloud State has this thing of they've been good before, but we're not able to get it done. Minnesota State is on this route of they've never been looked at as a a viable contender, as a legitimate contender. But that's what makes this matchup so interesting. That's why I may end up cheering for whoever wins this game in the national championship game. Because I like the idea of that St. Cloud State can come out through all that adversity and come back and win a national championship. At the same token, Dryden McKay having an incredible season. An offense that has nobody in the top 20, I believe, in the country in scoring. They're not a dominant offensive team, but they're going to work their way, and they're going to grind down the other team to win. I love that kind of hockey. To some people, it's boring as heck. But that is called good coaching and good execution by the other team, by the team in front of them. That's what makes it so much. That's what makes Minnesota State so fun to watch. I got to make a pick, though, because I got to pick who's going to win this whole thing, which is why I'm going to go with. Oh, it's tough. Mm, what do I want to do here? I'm resting on my mic right now. If you're not watching right now, if you're listening to the podcast, I'm just sitting on my mic trying to figure out what I want to pick. I, I had an idea when I was looking, when I was getting ready for the show today or this morning, I'm like, who am I going to pick tonight? Because there's. 
there is talent. There is a lot of good players on both teams. Who would I want to pick? Uh, you know what? I'm going to go with... I'm going to go with that route. I'm going to go Mavericks. I'm going to the WCHA route. Mavericks pull it out. They go to the national championship game. They're, they're just so... They're so defensively dominant. And I think that this... the the fact that out of the four teams that are there, UMass, we'll get to in a minute, they're all making their second appearance, but they're from Hockey East, and they're the 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 high class, you know, the pick that everyone wants to see from the East because, hey, look at this, they're in the Hockey East, and they were able to be the best. They were showing once again that they're great again. Even though this is, like I said, they're only their second tournament appearance and now second Frozen Four appearance. And Minnesota Duluth, the back-to-back defending champs, first team since possibly 1953 to win a three-peat. Everyone's looking at that as well. St. Cloud State, this team that's always been good but never been able to win, this may be their year. Minnesota State's being looked at as the afterthought in this tournament, and that's why I think that will give them that little bit of little bit of a competitive edge and maybe kind of light a fire into them saying, listen, guys, no one's respecting us. Let's make them respect us. And that's what makes Minnesota State so dominant and so dangerous going into the semifinal on Thursday. That's why I think they're going to win. Let's go to the other side, the nightcap game, the 9 o'clock game. UMass, the Minutemen, versus Minnesota Duluth. Like we talked about Minnesota Duluth, the team that is looking to become the first team since the university of Michigan back in 1953, back when my grandfather was in grammar school was the last time the NCAA has ever saw a three-peat. That was back. Of course, when the Kygler and literally like Minnesota or back when Michigan literally just, they, they really didn't have much to compete with. There was Colorado College, and Minnesota came along later in the in the decade, but the early 50s, the early on in the days, a Michigan athletics back in the early days of every sport, like football and hockey, they just seemed to dominate in the early days. Then people figure out how to play the sport, and it got a little bit tough for them. So holds true today. But Duluth, they they have so much great talent. They have Kobe Roth, Cole Kepke, the Cates with you know Jackson playing well. The big question is going to be the goaltending. Zach Sajal, who has who's a freshman, took over the job from Ryan Fancy as the season wore on. They make it to the NCHE semifinals. They get the at large bid because it is a tough conference to play in. Uh, I is the is the rookie going to be good? Because remember, guys, this is a goaltender in his first. NCAA tournament start, he had to leave the game because of cramps. He left. Now, I'm not saying that's because of the fact, oh, that means he's unprepared. He just got dehydrated. Now, as I'd say that now, as I'm grabbing my drink of water here, hold on a second. I don't want to be catching cramps. We're not going to go to overtime here today's show, but I'm just saying I don't want to catch cramps. So anyways, back to my point here. He's going to have to come up big because this is a UMass team that has a lot of players that were from that 2019 team. Now, granted, Kale McCarr just took that team and said, we're going to go all the way, boys. And, of course, we should also mention that this is the 2019 rematch of the 2019 final. UMD winning their second straight national title, beating Kale McCarr and the UMass Minutemen. UMass, they have, man, they they are. Whew, they, they are dangerous. They looked really good in the regionals. Like I have Matthew Kessel, who's big on the blue line. A guy that actually puts it puts up quite a good chunk of numbers for a defenseman as well. Bobby Trevino has played well. Carson Geisowitz, or uh, uh, Geisowitz has played well. Oliver Chow, Josh Lapina. And the big question for me, talk about Zach Sajal on the one side for the Bulldogs, Philip Lindbergh on the other side. Goaltender, drafted goaltender. He was drafted by Minnesota, like I said earlier. I almost forgot. He had the best goals against average in the league. He went 9-1-4, and four, excuse me, this season. Four shutouts, 9-4-6-8 percentage, which was best in the country. 1.33 goals against average, which was best in the country. In 14 games. 19 goals against. One of the best goaltenders in the country. Took the job away from Matt Murray. I don't know if... If you look at the goaltending matchup, you got to favor UMass in this one. Philip Lindbergh has been incredibly hot. He played extremely well in the regional tournament. If if he, excuse me, as I burp, if he was the starting goaltender from day one, 
his numbers would definitely compare more better, more better, better to Dryden McKay. That may have been a battle than who would be the Hobie Baker nominee and who would win the Mike Richter award. I think with Dryden McKay just doing it for the full season, I think that's what gives him the edge here. Philip Lindbergh, though, did it in just about half the games, which is why McKay will win it. But Lindbergh right now may be the hottest goaltender in college hockey. And it's tough to say. And I say that, like I said, after just praising Dryden McKay, Lindbergh has probably been the better of the goaltenders. And that's why I think UMass has the advantage in this one. They have the offense, but so does Minnesota Duluth. And they had the experience as well. I'm going to I'm going to quick jump on this train here with Minnesota Duluth. I'm going to go to the Minnesota Duluth. I'm going to go to their roster from 2019 cuz I don't exactly remember it off the top of my head of all the players that were there. Obviously Scott Prunovich was there. They had a little bit of a different core, but they have a lot of players that were on that team that won. I think they may have won in both years. Let me quickly poke on over 2018-2019 roster. Sorry, this is my website's a little funky to work right now. I do apologize. 2018-19, hit go. There we go. Come on. Load it up. There we are. Let's see. Yep, and Nick Wolf's gone. Perunovic. Yep, he's there. Kobe Roth was there. Kobe Bender was there. Jerry Hilderman was there. Cole Kepke was there. Jackson Cates was there. Noah Cates was there. Nick Sweeney was there. And tough to think he's gone. Hunter Shepard was their goaltender, so obviously not. So that's maybe the one thing is that their goaltender, obviously, was Zach Shazel being their starter. He is, you know, a guy that you know, wasn't there. And I wonder how he's going to do now with this pressure in the national spotlight. But Tyler, the regional games are also, listen, some of those games are on ESPN3, someone in ESPN+. Plus. Some people didn't get to watch those games. I did, of course, because I have ESPN+. Plus. But I'm saying, like, with the pressure of now playing in a national semifinal in Pittsburgh, all the pageantry's there. Everyone's there. Butcher Gross is unfortunately calling those games. Everyone's there. All the eyes will be on this matchup. I just, it's so tough for me because I, I want to pull for UMD because I, I was talking to some people earlier and this is what I said. I'm like, I love the opportunity to break records. That's why I think Dryden McKay this season in particular, I've really started to pull for him because the fact that I say this, the couple games went a different way. He was going to set the record this year for the most shutouts in a college hockey career. He would have beaten Ryan Miller's in three years so there would not be ever the discussion of, oh, was Ryan Miller better because he did it in three years? We won't, unfortunately, won't be able to have that conversation because everyone's going to be like, oh, Ryan Miller did it in three years. Anyways, regardless. Where was I going with this? Crap. <laughs> I lost my train of thought where I was yelling about this. But I like, oh, yeah, that's what I was going with, record breaking. I want to see a team do something that has not been done in almost 60 years. That's my thing about this. I want to see UMD do it but UMass is so good. Their goaltending's there, which by NCAA tournament standards just says that Minnesota Duluth is going to win this game. <sighs> Gosh. Uh, I'm Hold on. I'm thinking, guys. I'm thinking how I want to pick in this one. Go with my first choice. Well, my first choice, Dad. I My dad says go with your first choice. I don't know what my first choice is. My gut says Minnesota Duluth because this team's done. You know what? You're right, Dad. Minnesota Duluth. UMass has the talent. UMass has the skill. They have the goaltender. But you know what? I've seen this tournament work funny ways. I have seen Providence somehow beat Matt O'Connor and the Boston Terriers in Boston. I have seen Yale, Yale. I have seen Yale beat Quinnipiac in a final in Pittsburgh, by the way, which was the last time St. Cloud State was there. I have seen Union, led by Shane Gostaspare, who just cleared waivers, by the way, for some news for you folks. I have seen them win it. I have seen Minnesota Duluth beat the really good Luke Glenn Denning-led Sean Henwick goaltending University of Michigan in overtime in Minnesota. I remember that game. 2011 was 10 years ago, but I don't care. That game still pains me to watch. I have seen... Northern Michigan beat the almighty Boston Terriers. I have seen Lake State create a dynasty, and just as fast as the dynasty comes, it goes away. This college hockey tournament does not necessarily favor the favorites, which is why Minnesota Duluth against Minnesota State in the national championship game will be defeated or will be determined 
by whoever scores the most goals. Yes, I know, that's, that's kind of dumb. But what I mean is, Minnesota Duluth will win their third straight national championship. Because I just think Minnesota State, while they may make it all the way, they're going to have a great team. Duluth has the experience. They have the veterans that can get the job done. And that's why the Bulldogs will be the first team since 1953, since the Korean War, to have won three straight national championships. Dad says Duluth as well. He goes Duluth. I said I need a red wing shirt. I, I don't. I, I don't need a red wing shirt, Dad. Minnesota Duluth winning it all, knocking off Minnesota State. And I actually, hold on a second. Let me. I mean, still have time here on the show. Let me quick pull this up here. NCAA D1 Hockey National Champions. I'm gonna look this up here because I want to see how many has there if there's ever been an all Minnesota final. Let's see here. You got to find a champion first for Minnesota. Minnesota's first title was, holy criminy. When was their first title? 19, geez, 1974? Really? Really? But Minnesota got good. Oh, that's right. They lost. Ironically, Minnesota lost in 1953 to Michigan in that last year. Vic Heigler was the head coach of the Wolverines then. So let's see, 1970. Four was against Michigan Tech in Boston. That's what people. That's what people like. I'll get to this back in a second. People always like because from the movie Miracle, they're like, "Oh, Minnesota and Boston it was such a rivalry," and it was. It was two of the best teams in their respective regions. Minnesota versus Michigan Tech. John McKinnis versus Herb Brooks. That was the rivalry. That was the true rivalry. If you ask me, back in the seventies. As good as Boston was, which we've actually had an all Boston final. We've had, like I said, we had Prov- well, an all hockey East final, but we also had BU versus BC. That was back in 78. But that was my thing about that was everyone's like, oh, Boston, Minnesota, Boston, Minnesota. And you're right, yeah, East versus West, but Minnesota, Michigan Tech, that was the rivalry in the 70s. They played each other in three straight national championships, too. 74, Minnesota beats Tech. 75, Tech beats Minnesota. 76, Minnesota beats Tech. And I forgot if there was a point where Minnesota actually played Tech during the Frozen Four in the semifinals. But let's go back to this here. See if there we ever had. I, yeah, we've never had an all-Minnesota final. We've had all-Michigan finals. Michigan playing Tech in 56 with the Wolverines upending the Huskies. Excuse me. We've had Hall Hockey's finals, all WCHA finals, whatever. We've never had an all Minnesota final. So this will be the year. If Duluth can beat UMass, and I guess, I mean, despite me picking Minnesota State, St. Cloud can win as well, but we'd have an all Minnesota final, which would be historic. And Pat Micheletti will be the happiest human on the face of the Actually, a lot of people in Minnesota, not just, not just. Pat Micheletti, probably, probably John Micheletti as well. And probably half the people that live in the state of Minnesota. Go for Puck Live. May not like it, but that's not here nor there. Uh, by the way, Oilers are up one nothing at the end of the first period against Montreal. They scored first one nothing Edmonton right now, and Eric Stahl's debut as a <clears throat> excuse me as a Montreal Canadian. Uh, man, good lord! Another Connor Bedard highlight. Connor Bedard, who who Cody Jansen and myself talked about over the summer. About being too young, he's going to get beaten around the WHL. Yeah, he's got like 20 points in the first 12 games of his WHL career. He's he's tearing it up right now. We're going to take a break, folks, because uh, I feel like I need to take another one. By that, I mean I just, I'd like a drink of water, if that's okay with you guys. Is that okay if I take a drink? You guys, just relax a little bit. Have a drink of water. I think that'll be okay, right? I think it'll be okay. I'm going to take a break now, and we're going to come back. What to watch for, more news and notes, and more hockey talk. Shockingly enough, here on the hockey program. More of the Kiel Show right after this here on 12 Ounce Sports.
And welcome back to the Kuehl Show, everyone. Tyler Kuehl here, the Insider of the Insiders, on this Monday, April the 5th. Uh, oh, Lord, that was a pork chop burp supreme on that one. Huh. Welcome back to the show, everybody. If you're just joining us, well, we talked about quite a bit in the first little bit of change here. We have talked about the COVID problems surrounding the NHL, and we I went after the Texas Rangers and Globe Life Field and probably half the state of Texas talking about COVID down there. We talked about, just before the break, talking about the Hobie Baker Award and who I think is going to win it. And also Frozen 4 Preview and who I think is going to win the whole kit and caboodle. National Championship. Can't tell you who I picked because you got to watch the replay back. Watch it on the QL Show YouTube channel, which will be up tomorrow morning, as well as your favorite podcatcher if you just feel like listening to it on the in your car, at your desk, while you're running. Because I'm sure I, my voice is motivating. Get you running miles. Um, I can never run with listening to myself. I barely listen to myself as it is. I can barely deal with my the voices that are in my head. No. Um, but yeah, no, check it out. The favorite podcatcher that you have, we're on it. Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, uh, Pretty sure there's another one. Bye. We're on all of them. We're everywhere on the Kilo Show. And also, if you just feel like clicking it, if you follow me on LinkedIn, well, you'll see it there because I post on LinkedIn every week as well because people like to look at it there. Anyways, kind of wrapping up here in the last half hour and change. By the way, coming up at the bottom of the next hour, talking Myers with the Rando. He'll be chatting more about sports. Remember, he had a fun little impromptu guest appearance with rando last week we were talking about tim peel and the referee situation across the national hockey league that you can also find on the kill show youtube channel and your favorite podcatcher as well so just quick look around the scores right now the out of town scoreboard boston and philly one one after one dan vladar i'm gonna go with vladar because he's from Prague, czech republic right so that means it's gotta be vladar right or Vla- that's vladar right i'm gonna go with vladar he stopped nine out of ten in that game so far as i go back to the box score claude Giroux scoring, or no, Travis Konechny scoring for Philly, Claude Giroux and Ivan Prover off the assist. Carson Kuhlman getting his second of the season with Charlie Coley getting the assist from Boston. Edmonton right now, like we said, leading the Montreal Canadiens after one period of play, one nothing. The goal score, Devin Shore, his third of the year. Ottawa and Winnipeg right now end of the first period in that one. Jets right now leading the Senators by a score of one nothing. Remember, the Sens actually beat Montreal on Saturday night, 6-3. to three. Pierre-Luc Dubois scoring his eighth of the season for the Jets. Coming up later tonight, Vegas versus St. Louis. Colorado and Minnesota. That'll be a big game. We'll get to that in just a little bit. Toronto and Calgary at 9-30, the second half of the back-to-back. And that one, Los Angeles taking on Arizona. Boston and Philly tomorrow getting postponed? What? Oh, that's probably a typo. They're probably talking about the Vancouver games. Let's get postponed tonight. Because I'm like, how is Boston Philly, who is playing right now, gets postponed for tomorrow? That doesn't quite make a whole lot of sense. Anyways, speaking of Vancouver, the Angels announced today the schedule changes for the Oilers, Senators, and Flames. As of right now, Edmonton at Ottawa, which was supposed to be April 9th, will be moved to April 8th. So one day push for that one. It'll be a 7 o'clock puck drop at the Canadian Tire Center up in Canada. Edmonton at Calgary from May the 7th will be moved all the way to April 10th. These are obviously moved to be because of the fact that Vancouver may not be playing for the foreseeable future right now because of their COVID problems. Uh, or Edmonton has had a few extra days rest because they were supposed to play Vancouver this past weekend, like I said, heading to this game tonight against Montreal. So it'll be a little interesting to see what more changes we see. There could be more coming soon in terms of schedule changes. So. We'll definitely keep our eyes on that retrospect. By the way, one nothing lead for Edmonton. Montreal, though, shooting out shooting Edmonton. Montreal out shooting Edmonton. 14 to 5 right now. So don't don't watch out too yet, folks. Or don't uh, don't turn away yet. So as we move along here in the show, I had an thing. Where'd that article go? I had a piece about the trade deadline that went away. I just had something here. Gosh darn it, where'd it go? Stinking, starkin'. I, I lost it. <laughs> it, was a, it was a thing. It was a an article from uh, Rylan that had to talking about the what teams will be doing at the trade deadline coming up here. And it disappeared. It literally dis- I, okay, didn't literally disappear, but gosh darn it, where the heck did it go? 
Oh, criminy. Oh, well. All right, how are we going to fill the last half hour? Well, we we mentioned the COVID protocols already. We talked about Eric Stahl making his appearance first game tonight against Montreal. Gosh darn it, where'd that article go? <laughs> I had a... I had a great piece on it as well. I was going to take it, and we're going to talk about the trade deadline, like we said, coming up this Monday. And I gave a little bit of my take as well going into, like, what teams will be doing what moving forward. And gosh darn it, where are they? I can't believe I lost it. Ugh, that hurts. Man. That's a bummer. I was going to, oh, here we go. Oh, what? Oh, shucks, Jolly Bee Willikers. Well, it's gone. Okay, well, oh, if I find it later. I mean, well, obviously, like I said, next week, it'll be right after the trade deadline. Monday is the deadline. We'll go through pretty much every trade that happens that day. Of course, that's including the fact that there are trades that day. I See, that's why I've been trying to figure out this year. Because think of it this way. For the Canadian teams, because this, like I said, this is Eric Stahl's first game in Montreal. He had to wait seven days. His, co- his COVID protocol, or his COVID seven-day quarantine, ended Saturday. Couldn't play, though, obviously, because, well, that's the final day that it was. So I, I wonder, because the Canadian teams, they're not going to want to wait until April the 19th for their players to come, you know, for the guys they trade for to play. You'll see a lot of the Canadian teams be active probably within the next 48 hours. Everyone right now is looking at Toronto and saying goaltender because of the fact that Freddie's still hurt and people for some reason, and Jack Campbell, they're, they're still questioning if he's a hundred percent because he's, he's had, he's had a little tough go. He's, he can't, he missed a little bit of time. Yes. His numbers are great, but it just seems like he's not 100%. They're trying to limit his load so he doesn't get hurt. And Hutchinson of course played really well last night. Um, a lot of the players are, a lot of people are wondering, will Toronto look to the Marlies for a goaltender to, for one of their goaltenders to play? Obviously there's Joseph Wool, former Boston college goaltender. There is, I keep forgetting how to say his name, but I'm going to try to say it as hard as I can. Um, uh, it's Vili. Oh gosh. I, I boy, I, I'm going to try to say it here. It's going to hurt my brain. Vinny, oh gosh, here we go. Vienny Vevelainen, 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 Vinny Vevelainen. I'm going to go with that, Vinny Vevelainen. He was traded, he was involved in the trade that sent Miko Lettinen to Columbus. And Vevelainen, Vevelainen has, he's a mainly, mainly only played in the AHL. He did get called up to the taxi squad though uh, yesterday. So that's why people thought maybe he was going to start tonight. Now, however, as I jump over to our good friends at Left Wing Lock, there may be, as far as we know, we're going to be seeing uh, Jack Campbell tonight. And yes, it's been confirmed. He'll be taking out, going up against Jacob Markstrom. Now, people are like, well, if you traded for him, why don't you want to play him? Well, this was mainly a move. That that move with Toronto, with Lettinen and Villavinen, that was a move to more or less get give Lettinen a chance to play because even though, I mean, it's funny how Lettinen fell all the way back from power play time to the Marlies. Like I, I still am kind of on the edge about that. Obviously it seems like Sheldon Keefe has his defense core that he wants to keep with him as the season goes on now. But I like to think that now we're going to see, you know, that's why Lettinen got moved and they want something to return. And obviously goaltending depth is important, especially in the AHL level where Alex or Ian Scott's, a little bit injury prone, as we've learned. Joseph Wool is good, but we don't know if he's ever going to get the shot to be an NHL goaltender. So, like I said, these are all things that the Leafs will consider with goaltending. But I, my thing is this, because everyone's like, you got to get a goaltender. You need a capable goaltender. <sighs> yes, look at you look at the goaltenders that have won the Stanley Cup in the past. It's like, who is a bad goaltender? <sighs> Here's the thing. If you are the Toronto Maple Leafs, Let's just say Frederick gets healthy soon here. They're reevaluating him this week to see what his time frame is. As of right now, it's still kind of, you know, iffy if he's going to play anytime soon for the Toronto Maple Leafs. But let's just say he does come back healthy in a month. Or I'll say two weeks. We'll say that. 
Then you have Jack Campbell, Michael Hutchinson, both who have been playing really well this year, and Frederick Anderson, who can, who is your starting goaltender, and yes, has had injury issues, and of course, now looking at the past, he has had problems in the playoffs. But if you have all three of them healthy, and you can go to any three of those goaltenders in the playoffs, there are worse problems to have, right? Like, that's what I'm beginning to try to figure out here, guys. Is that a huge problem? If you can, if like, say Freddie starts. Freddie comes back to form. He's ready for the playoffs. First two games, we're dud. By the way, good to see Brian Mudrick back in the booth for TSN calling the Habs game tonight. He's been doing a lot with the curling. If you guys remember Brian Mudrick we had on a few weeks ago. Of course, that was before Montreal had a slide and they had to fire their coach. So there's that. But regardless, <laughs> But that's my thing is like, if you have three goaltenders, like we saw with Colorado, they they got beat by Dallas because they unfortunately fell behind early. Michael Hutchinson played it fantastic in the two games that he had to play in. And you had a great outing out of Pablo Francois before he got hurt. And of course, you had Philip Grubauer for Colorado. You'll have three goaltenders in Frederick Anderson, Michael Hutchinson, and Michael, like I said, Hutchinson, and Jack Campbell. You have three goaltenders that are capable of giving you starts in the National Hockey League. Why would you try to go look and spend money and have to give up assets because the Leafs are a little bit in cap trouble right now, especially the flat cap there, children. They can't afford to give up players because they have the group they want now. Are you going to get rid of your top prospects? Are you going to get rid of Sandine? Are you going to get rid of Lilligren? Young defense that you're going to need later on when Zach Bogosian and TJ Brody go out to pasture? You're going to need guys like that. You need to keep those kids around. You can't get rid of them. So if you can play with the goaltenders you have now, why not? What if you find a hot goaltender? What if Campbell has this hot year, this Jordan Bennington-esque year? Look at St. Louis now. Jordan Bennington's all of a sudden not the great goaltender that we all thought he was going to be. But he had a great hot run. They won the cup. I'm pretty sure Leafs fans would be like, you know what? If Jack Campbell is our guy... If Michael Hutchinson becomes our guy, as long as we lift that silver trophy over our heads at the end of the playoffs and we're the last team standing, so be it. It doesn't matter if it's Frederick Anderson. If they can play, if they can start, if they can step up when they need it, that's all this team needs. They just need one goaltender to play well. And right now, they have three goaltenders. Yes, Freddie was obviously hurt. That makes a lot of sense why he was playing poorly. You get a healthy Freddie. You got a 95% Jack Campbell, and you have Michael Hutchinson, who is looking eons better from when he was traded from Toronto last season, when he went to Colorado and almost saved the season for the Avalanche. That's what I'm saying, guys. You have three NHL-capable goaltenders. I'm sick of this conversation of, oh my gosh, their goaltending is going to be a problem. Their goaltending is a problem. They're They're winning games! And their goaltenders are playing well. Hutchinson, I think, made 32 saves last night against Calgary. But Calgary's offense has been a bummer. But look how bad the Leafs were in front of them, in front of him last night. Don't tell me that the Leafs don't have NHL caliber goaltenders. Don't give me that lame excuse. That is cheap and lazy reporting, insider, whatever you want to call it, analysis. That's lazy. The Leafs have... Two goaltenders that are NHL capable. They have one that's getting healthy. That's one, two, three goaltenders that you have for the playoffs. Now, I'm not saying the Leafs are going to play all three in the playoffs. I mean, it's happened before with some teams. Like I said, last year there was Colorado. But I'm saying is, if you have three, why would you ever look for another one? Seriously, guys, when was the last time a goaltender got traded at the deadline that actually worked? And don't anyone point to me and say Chris Osgood with St. Louis. They didn't win a darn thing. And guess what? St. Louis also made that mistake about 10 years later with Ryan Miller. And look how that worked out, children. St. Louis fans, you know what I'm talking about. That was a great first-round knockout, wasn't it? That's what I'm getting at, guys. Trading for a goaltender at the deadline is the stupidest thing you can do. When you get rid of a goaltender, that's whatever. Anders Nielsen getting traded in Ottawa from, to Ottawa in the middle of the season, whatever. But trading for a goaltender... A starting goaltender, because obviously that's what everyone's looking for in Toronto. 
Everyone who doesn't think Jack Campbell's going to be good enough. Everybody thinks Michael Hutchinson's not going to be good enough. Everybody thinks Mike, Freddie Anderson will either not be healthy or not be good enough. I just put up three options there. Regardless, that's my thing is it doesn't matter if they'll be good enough, if they'll be bad enough. They need to find a way to win with the goaltenders they have. Chicago did it with Corey Crawford, right? St. Louis did it with Jordan Bennington, who got really hot. Yes, you're right. 2018, Braden Holpe, who didn't even start the playoffs. Philip Grubauer was starting the playoffs that year for Washington. Did Washington go out for a goaltender? No, they went with what they had. Has Freddie played like a Vezina caliber goaltender before? Absolutely. I'm sorry. I am so tired of this. They need a goaltender. They need a goaltender. Everything else is fine. They need a goaltender. When the goaltending gets bad, let me know. At what point has the goaltending been consistently bad that is not named Frederick Anderson? Freddie, as we've learned, was hurt. So that's why he was bad. But Campbell, knock on wood, his numbers are great. Plays again tonight, like I said, against Calgary. Michael Hutchinson. Has he had a couple duds? Sure. Name me a backup that hasn't had a couple of duds, though. Seriously. Answer that for me. Carey Price just got hit, by the way, but he's okay. Speaking of goaltenders that have had some bad starting goaltenders that had some iffy years so far this season. That's my problem with this whole scenario with the Leafs. I, I Like I said, I pull for the Leafs. Yeah. Oh, but I'm wearing a Canucks shirt. Listen, I'm, I'm wearing a Canucks shirt for a reason. Still a Leafs fan. Probably will be watching the game tonight when I, or listening to it as I'm going to bed tonight. But that's my problem with this is everyone's thinking, oh, they need a goaltender. They need a goaltender. They need a goaltender. It's who are you going to get? And at what price? Oh, if Darcy Kemper was healthy. Well, shoot, he's not. And Freddie's not healthy either. We can get Alex and Del- What about Alex Nedeljkovic? He's been playing well. Oh, yeah, you're telling me Alex Nedeljkovic is more reliable than a guy like Jack Campbell, Michael, Michael, yeah, Michael Hutchinson. Alex Nedeljkovic, who hasn't won a gosh darn thing in his life. But yes, he won, the, excuse me, he won the Calder Cup with Charlotte a couple years back. Pardon me. You get my point, though, guys. That, that's just my thing about this whole scenario is like, that's what people continue to tell me. And I'm just like, I, I don't, I don't buy it. The good teams find a way to win with their goaltenders. That's what I'm saying. A great goaltender helps, but what's the market like this year? You're going to sell your entire, how much are you going to give up? And then you're going to have to wait a week. Probably. What are you going to trade within the division? Edmonton's going to keep Smith and Koskinen. Smith's been playing great this year. Montreal's going to get rid of Carey Price or Jake Allen? Pfft, yeah, for maybe six first rounds and half your farm system. Well, you get, oh my gosh. Oh man, we got to go for, we got to go for Marcus Holberg down there in Ottawa. Oh, we got to save Big Save Dave Riddick. People are saying Dave Riddick's going to be the guy to come to Toronto. Yes, because Big Save Dave has been good this year. There's a reason why it's called Big Save Dave. He makes the big save. However, the other 30 shots he has to face, that's a little bit questionable if you ask me. Toronto wants to win this year. They're going to have to win with house money. They're going to have to win with the goaltenders they have. They have three capable NHL goaltenders. Name me another team in this league that is towards the top of their division that have three NHL quality goaltenders. Name me another one, guys. Give me another one. Waiting. I'll wait for you. We got 20, we got 20 minutes left on the show. Tell me. Come on. I'll be here all night. I'll wait. I don't care. I'm just, I'm just saying, guys. Name me another team that is going to, that has three starting goaltenders on their team. Three caliber, three starting caliber goaltenders. There is not. There is not a team. You have a great tandem going in Minnesota, yes. And Hunter Jones, by the way, picked up a big one yesterday for Iowa Wild, by the way. But that's what I'm saying. It's like three goaltenders that are with the team right now that'll be able to play in the playoffs. I don't see another team that has the goaltending depth that people just seem to overlook. Is Friday your Stanley Cup winning goaltender? Probably not. 
Is Michael Hutchinson? I don't know. Is Jack Campbell? I don't know, because they haven't really ever gotten a shot in the playoffs. Jack Campbell, up until probably two years ago, was all of a sudden looking like a total bust and an absolute failure of a prospect, but all of a sudden plays a few good games behind Jonathan Quick, traded the Leafs, and all of a sudden Jack Campbell is a quality backup, and now he is a starting goaltender with excellent numbers. I'm not going to say his numbers because he plays tonight, and I don't want to do that to him. It's not gone wood. Give this group a shot. Quit being like the Toronto media that you are. Trust me, for a while I followed it just like that. I'm like, oh my gosh, they need this. Oh my gosh, the Leafs need this. They need this, this, and this. Look at the team that's playing right now. Yes, I don't know how they're going to do against Vegas or Colorado that comes out of that division. Maybe even Minnesota. I don't know how they'll do against them. I don't know how they'll do against Tampa or Carolina or Florida. I don't know if they'll be able to get through the Islanders or the Capitals or if Boston actually turns around Boston. I don't know. None of us know. That's the, that is the special, and that is the uniquely fun and interesting thing about this season. We don't know who the best team in the NHL is. Toronto may just whack through the rest of the divisions in the semifinals and finals. Vegas may win every game by six goals. Tampa may go back to back this year. We don't know. But for Toronto's sake, just go with what you got. Just do it. If you can't, tough nuts, Batman. You lose, you try again next year. Maybe in a, in a little bit more of a simple year. That's my take on that. A little bit less than 20 minutes left on this show. Let's get to the what to watch for us this week. Big game tonight. Talk about a little bit. Nine o'clock puck drop between... Make sure I got the time right, right? Nine o'clock on that one. Nope, just starting actually right now. Minnesota in St. Paul against... Excuse me, I didn't hold it for a fact. I just had a burp. Against the Colorado Avalanche. Two of the best teams right now in the Western Division and in the league. We talked about how good their goaltending is. Colorado currently right now Tops in the division in points. They have, they're one game ahead of both Vegas and Minnesota because Minnesota and Vegas each have 36 games played. Each have a game in hand on Colorado. Colorado, though, has been hot lately. They've won four of their last five games. They are top of the division by four points, 54 points. Minnesota, two points behind Vegas for second. And they are seven points ahead of Arizona for fourth in that West division that's looking like possibly St. Louis, Arizona, or San Jose. We'll get to the Sharks here in just a minute. They play tonight and Wednesday night. I like this matchup because it's another, for me, every single time Minnesota plays, I, I just want to see, because they won against Vegas yesterday, played a big game against them. Talbot was huge in that. And that's why I think it's a little bit of a tough go here for the Wild. Was it last night or was it Saturday night? Hold on a second. Let me see if I can pull it up here. So I can find pull up their schedule. It was, was it yesterday? I thought it was yesterday, was it not? Why can't Sportsnet, why can't you put the date on the darn thing? Was it yesterday? I don't know anymore. Crime any. I have to go to Angel now. <laughs> Figure out when this game was. I just want to know, guys. Was it yesterday? Because I'm pretty sure I watched the highlights back today. Uh, where are you? Nope, it was Saturday. It was Saturday. Okay. So Saturday, a big win over Vegas. Each of these games that Minnesota plays, like Colorado or Vegas for like, cause I feel like the rest of the division, they should be able to beat. Hence why they are the third best team in the Western division right now, the Honda West division. Every time I see this, like, I wonder honestly how good this team is, by the way, apparently they haven't had their first whistle yet in the Vegas St. Louis game, at least according to their, the Twitter from Vegas so 46 seconds ago, <laughs> and they've they've played about six minutes so far, but that's a hey, that's a great start to the game. Quick, uh, quick story on that. We'll get to back to Minnesota and Colorado here in a second. Thomas Biondo and I, ten uh, time guest on the show, Thomas Biondo. We did a women's hockey game once, where we went something like eleven minutes in a game without a whistle, and I mean from puck drop, first period, not like second period or not just long stretch, puck drop. We went over half a period from puck drop. It was incredible because for us, it was, I think it was the end of like a three game day for us because we have four teams at Davenport, right? So I think I had one, I think we had a D1 game. They, him and I called, then I had a D2 game by myself. And then we had a women's game to cap the night off. And we were like, let's, 
let's move it along here, folks. And we were just like, yes, perfect start. And then it was like the second period was penalty filled and took forever. So that was a uh, not fun to call. <laughs> so it's not fun to call after that, but it kind of evened it out back to Minnesota, Colorado though. The avalanche, once again, that's a team that people are trying to figure out what that team needs. I don't know what that team needs. Like I said, the veteran aspect of it, they probably would like to have. They have grit with guys like Kadri and whatnot, but I I don't know if they are ready for My goodness, Connor Bedard scored Connor Bedard scored again. Holy cow. They just scored against Moose Jones. Good lord, that kid. If he keeps it up. He's only 15 by the way. For those that probably don't remember the story, Connor Bedard getting exceptional status to play in the WHL this season. It's a 15-year-old, tore it up a little bit in the European League. I think he played in the U20 League in Sweden. And right now he is the leading scorer, or one of the leading scorers in the WHL as a 15-year-old. Back to Minnesota, Colorado, before I keep forgetting here. I, I like this matchup because it shows that the Wild can play with the best in the league. And they don't, it's the crazy thing. Yeah, you have Kirill, or, uh, Kirill Kaprizov, who's probably going to win the Calder at this rate if he can keep it up. And you have Dumba, but they don't really have the superstars. Kaprizov is the closest thing they have. And you have a great goaltending tandem, similar to what Vegas had before Robin Leonard started having concussion problems again. But they, they have this talent right now and this ability to win in Minnesota that I didn't think that we expected coming in. Like I said this, I said coming in the year, they'll finish fourth in the division because they always find a way and they'll lose out in the first round, just like they do every year. All of a sudden, Minnesota's looking like a team that may, be a comp- may win a round. Now, I, like I said, in a seven-game series against Vegas, who has made deep playoff runs over the two of the past their first three seasons, I'm not sure. Obviously, the, the veteran aspect on their end, Petrangelo, uh, and you have Mark Stone and uh, Mark Andre Fleury in net and Theodore and Martinez. Like that team is filled with players that have a won cups and have had deep playoff runs and are grizzled vets and are talented grizzled vets at that. It's a really impressive bunch there in Vegas. They're playing St. Louis right now. They just scored. We had a goal. Was that really the first whistle was a goal? No way. That's crazy. By the way, Winnipeg up three, one right now. And oh yeah, they're St. Louis just tweeted their thing there, posted their their tribute to Alex Petrangelo, who is playing his first game due after many uh postponements and whatnot, but their first game in St. Louis against as a Vegas Golden Knight, which I think is kind of special because I think St. Louis only recently just started allowing fans back in. So it's kind of good to see maybe some fans there in attendance at Enterprise Center. But, yeah, the, the couple games here against Minnesota, another couple tests to show if they can hang with the best in the division, if they are going to be taken seriously. Caps and Isles tomorrow at 7. Two best teams in the East. That'll be an interesting game. The Islanders, who are... They're, they just flex their muscles right now. They're, Matthew Barzell is on some sort of a heater that I don't think we've seen him on in a couple of years. We Remember how we were talking about how Matthew Barzell was just going to be, oh, my gosh... He's not playing well. They are second right now, are the Islanders. They're behind Washington. I forgot that Washington jumped them over the last couple of games because Washington was able to beat New Jersey yesterday. They both have 38 games played. Right behind them, though, Pittsburgh, 50 points. And then in fourth place, unless Philly turns it around, it'll be Boston in fourth place because they have 43 points, four points ahead of Philadelphia. Philadelphia has 20 games left in the season. Boston has 22 two games at hand for the Bruins and uh, they may be struggling, but the, they may, they may end up getting a playoff spot just because of the fact, but caps and Isles tomorrow, you got, you know, a, a, a caps team that I thought was going to take a dip because, you know, Visek Vanacek and Samsonov, Ilya Samsonov. I didn't think they were going to be good enough. Samsonov played amazing yesterday against New Jersey. New Jersey's just so pesky this year, guys. They're not going to be a playoff team. I get it, but dang, they're tough to play against somehow. They're always hanging around. They're always keeping games close. Man, just, it's one of the, it's, I don't want to say it's like Detroit last year, but two years ago, Detroit, where they would lose by one or two, or they would give up a lead late. They would always find ways to lose games, but they'd always be in the game for the majority of it. It's like typical Detroit sports, like the Detroit Lions. Always there in the fourth quarter, and they somehow blow it somehow magically. Also, you have Canes and Panthers in Carolina for a pair of games, Tuesday and Thursday. Another interesting matchup between two teams that are in that central division that is just bonkers right now. Panthers, dare I say it, 
Division leading Panthers, which, by the way, the only times they've ever made the playoffs, they've been the division champs, right? Well, at least in 2012 and 2016, they won the Southeast and Atlantic divisions, respectively. However, they're in the Central Division right now, two points ahead of Tampa. Do have one game, though, in uh, Tampa does have one game in hand. Carolina has two. Carolina with 53 points. There's 56 points for Florida, 54 points for Tampa, 53 for Carolina, and 41 for Nashville in fourth place. It's going to be, looks like it's going to be a three-way dance between Nashville, Chicago, and Dallas. I don't think Columbus will make anything of it. Detroit's only 10 points back, though, guys. However, they have played 40 games, though, so that'll be their downfall, the fact that they have played one more game than Nashville and Chicago. Dallas has only played 36, though, so they actually have the most games remaining in that central division. But I just don't know if Dallas can put it together to get some wins. That's my thing. It's like they, they have the talent. They Antonio Dobin played great against Carolina yesterday. Just couldn't pull it off, though, because there's just no offense going for that Stars team right now. Looks like Nashville and Chicago will duke it out because Columbus just seems – Columbus is not turning to a dumpster fire, but – if uh, Tortorella is going to be out after the season, guys, mark my words on that one. Got Habs and Leafs on Wednesday night, which will be a little bit interesting because it'll be Toronto coming back home, playing three games in four nights and four games in six nights. Cause they've played on Friday, played Wednesday, Friday, both against the jets. And now they will play back to back against Calgary and have to come back to play Montreal for a one-off on Wednesday night. That'll be an interesting game because you have Montreal who's just fighting for their life for a playoff spot in Toronto, trying to stay hot with two goaltenders that are continuously overlooked, as I said earlier. And I think the big one coming out west this week outside of Minnesota and Colorado, mainly because of one of the teams involved, not both of them, just one. Sharks and Kings back-to-back Friday, Saturday. Kings, yes, they are not in the playoff race right now. They have fallen out quickly. They are seven points back of fourth place Arizona. However, only three points back from Arizona are the San Jose Sharks, a team that is 6-3-1 in their last 10. Winners of four straight. The Sharks that I swear were done before the season was over. I picked them last. I said it was in terms of teams of California, how it's going to go. It's going to go Anaheim, LA, Lot, or San Jose. That's how it's going to go. And that's how the bottom of the division was going to look as well. Boy, was I wrong. L.A. and Anaheim are racing for the bottom, even though L.A. for a moment was in a playoff spot for a breath of fresh air. That is the bottom three, though, are the California teams. However, it is in the complete opposite order of how I had them at the beginning of the season. San Jose is hot. L.A. is not. L.A. has lost three of their last ten, dropping their last couple of games. Obviously, they play, both play a couple of games before this weekend, but, boy, San Jose is... San Jose... It's going to be interesting. I, I I don't know if they're going to have enough to make it all the way. If if Arizona can come back, because Aiden Hill's been playing pretty good, something I did not think I was going to say for the Coyotes. I thought Darcy Kemper was going to be the guy that led them, and they have to have to jump over St. Louis as well, and St. Louis is looking kind of down in the dumps right now. I don't know if they're going to have the ability to bounce back and come back around. If they can, though, if Bennington can pick it up, or if, I mean, Huso's starting tonight, the second start in a row against Vegas, and they're already down one nothing in this hockey game. I don't know, man. San Jose may be back in the playoffs again, which nobody wants to see because they'll probably get the fourth seed, which I strictly gave to Minnesota. Of course, then I picked Dallas finished fourth in the Central, and look how that's looking. So, hey, look at that. Eric Stahl getting on the stat sheet for the first time with Montreal, going off for two minutes for a penalty. Power play for Edmonton. They still lead one nothing. In Perry 2 in the Bell Center. So, yeah, that is pretty much it for this one. That is your what to watch for this week. Next week, of course, like we said, it'll be the reaction to the national championship of the NCAA Men's Division One Hockey Tournament. Obviously, there is the basketball game tonight. Probably not going to watch it because I got a lot of work to do. Got to finish editing this thing. And also, we'll be talking about the trade deadline. It'll come and go. Hopefully, we have some big trades to talk about or else it may be another boring show. Hopefully we don't have anything else to say anything stupid. Hopefully we, the COVID problems start to limit themselves down a little bit. Hopefully we don't have a massive influx in the area of Arlington, Texas after their first home series where they literally decided to pack the place with people that were not wearing masks. I just, uh, I can't. It's, I, I literally looked at that and I'm like, I'm at that point in my life again. And I, I talk about this all the time with other people. 
when you are looking at people like big groups of people and you're like, like I was watching highlights today of Joe Bowen's call, favorite calls. And I'm like, wow, look at all those people inside that arena. That looks unsafe. Like that's how I look at that nowadays, right guys? It's kind of sad, but that's kind of how it's been for the last over a year. You see a group, big group of people. I'm like, I don't want to be near that. I see a big group of people at a, like a mall or I see a bunch of people coming out of the restaurant. I'm like, I don't know if I want to be here right now, guys. It's kind of tight quarters. And I saw that guy breathe over there a little too heavily. I don't know if I want to be here. It's just, it's kind of weird, right? So that's why I see the big group of people in Texas. And some people are like, oh, this will be a great test to see if masks really do work or whatever. And I'm like, oh, good Lord. Don't come at me with this herd immunity stuff, please. Don't start doing that now. But that is it for this week's show, folks. Thank you all for tuning in. If you weren't able to watch all this, if you missed the first part of the show, that's okay. Make sure you tune in to the replay, which will be up tomorrow on the Cool Show YouTube channel and also your favorite podcatcher as well if you don't feel like watching. We've been live here on 12 Ounce Sports. We'll be live next week as well, 6 o'clock Eastern time. We have one guest confirmed. Maybe we'll get a couple more to talk about the trade deadline and see what teams will do. But that is it for this week's episode. Make sure you follow us at The Kewl Show on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Hashtag TKS when we talk about today's show. We will see you next time on The Insider of the Insiders. Tyler Kewl saying so long, and we'll see you next week on The Kewl Show. Goodbye, everybody.